I must confess, this process hasn't exactly been easy for me. Waiting through the memories of what happened feels like digging through the rubble of your home after a tornado. I look for anything worth salvaging and try to ignore the rest. Those three days feel like an exposed nerve in my mind. The wounds, both physical and mental, are still fresh. This is a process. My shrink says the best way to heal is by facing the trauma head on. So, I force myself to remember it one more time. Put it all on paper. Even the parts I don't... Even the parts that don't make any sense. Let's get on with it. This whole thing began a couple months ago with a phone call to my office. I ran a small operation out of New Orleans, meaning I answer the phone when I'm not in the field. I'm one of the dozens of private investigators in the city specializing in infidelity cases. Yeah, I know. What a cliche, but pays the bills and keeps the door open. More or less. Reagan's private investigator, I said in the receiver. Answering the phone is just another part of the job. Usually old clients looking for an update or the occasional confused telemarketer. I don't get many new cases from clients calling me, and despite what you may have seen on television, there's no such thing as a walk-in client in a place like this. If I want a new job, I have to make friendly with one of the divorce lawyers, or grease the palms of a certain madam in a certain establishment who knows exactly when a marriage is coming to an abrupt end. I multitask when I can, which means I was cyber-stalking a cheating asshole husband on Facebook when I answered the phone. This douchebag was using an alias to lure in impressionable college girls, while his long-suffering soon-to-be ex-wife was at her parents' house taking care of the kids. That douchebag was my client, and had paid me good money to dig up dirt in his old lady. Uh, hey, uh, hi. The voice on the other line stammered. I stopped what I was doing and gave the phone all my attention. That voice sounded like it belonged to someone young. There was a hint of fear in it. Hi, I answered, trying my best to sound like a calming presence, something something I had zero patience with. You've reached Eric Riggin. Eric, um, hey, the voice answered. It was definitely a kid's voice. It's me, James. I scanned my mind for any Jameses I knew, but came back blank. Not surprising. I don't know many kids. Uh, well, what can I do for you, James? This is about Vanessa. I don't know if you heard what happened or not. Holy shit. Vanessa? That must mean that this kid is... Jamie? I asked. Hey, kiddo. I didn't recognize your voice. How long's it been? It's, it's been, um... A few years. Yeah. Sorry about that. I've never been good at the whole uncle thing. After my only brother died, I swore to myself I'd check in on his kids from time to time, but there's something about real life. It can't be stopped or paused or put on hold. Sometimes it takes all your attention. Look, I know I'm a shit uncle, just like I was a shit brother, but at least I could acknowledge that. So Vanessa, I asked. It was his older sister. I did some quick math, came up with her current age. Eighteen. Jeez. It's really been that long. What happened? Is she okay? Oh, um, I guess you don't know. I'm not sure who was supposed to tell you. Oh, shit. My mind jumped to all the worst-case scenarios, and... All my years in the city gave my imagination plenty to work with. Just tear the band-aid off quick, kid. I haven't heard anything, Jamie. Tell me what happened. She's missing. Missing? She's 18. She's got rebellious rig and blood. And if she's anything like the last time I saw her, smart as hell. Missing could be anything. How long? I asked. Two weeks. Who was the last person to see her? Did she say anything? Leave a note? Pack a bag? Um, I was overloading the poor kid. Can you, maybe, um, come here? If it hadn't been my own flesh and blood asking me, I might have laughed into the receiver right then. Jamie, I, I have a job. Jeez, did I really just say that? Oh, okay. I thought I'd ask. Thanks anyway. Hey, wait, is, is your mom around? Can I talk to... He had already hung up the phone. I have a job? The hell's wrong with me? It took me all of ten minutes to make up my mind that I was going to go back to that shitty town. When I swore I'd never go back to. A town where I grew up swearing I'd find a way to escape. A town where I left my brother's body in the ground. I made arrangements to put what cases I had on hold. 
Sent some select screenshots to my douchebag client's wife from an anonymous email. Next, I threw a few supplies into the go bag that I kept by the door. Some clothes, cash, smokes, my Beretta 9mm, and a bottle of liquid courage. Everything I might need for a week or so away from the comforts of home. I tried calling Jamie a couple more times after I hit the interstate, but his line stayed busy. I tried at least once an hour, but it never went through. You know that sinking feeling in your gut when something bad is about to happen and there's nothing you can do to stop it? That's what I had. Times a thousand. I drove all night, stopping only for gas and bathroom breaks, eating and smoking in the car. Vanessa was just like her father. Probably too much so for her own good. And that backward small town wasn't kind to smart or different people. I could just imagine how my last few years had gone. That high school where I had to break a few kids' noses just to get left alone at lunchtime wasn't for the weak or kind. But maybe things had changed since I left. It was afternoon by the time I got to Jamie and Vanessa's home. The kid was pure shock to see me and the feeling was absolutely reciprocated. He was 15 years old, two feet taller than the last time I saw him. In fact, he was taller than me now. And the spitting image of his father it was downright eerie. Gave him a hug, and he invited me in. I hate to say it, but even after all this time, I didn't really do the whole catching up thing. Maybe after this blows over, I'll ask him about his friends and grades and whatever, but at that moment, all I wanted to do was get down to business. Thankfully, he felt the same way. We sat in the cramped, dusty living room in his family's three-bedroom ranch-style house. It was smaller than I remembered. The front and backyard overgrown with weeds. They lived in a part of town that looked like nature was slowly taking it back. I would say that they were in the poor part of town, but that place only had poor parts. The fact they weren't living in a trailer put them in the top tier of luxury. All I could think while I was there was, God, I hate this place. The story fell together like I expected. She'd been talking about getting out, and even started working a part-time job at the gas station at the edge of town. One night, she went outside for a walk, and that was the last anyone saw of her. Jamie was in the living room and saw her leave, but didn't think much about it. She wasn't carrying anything with her. She didn't look strange or high or drunk. She just walked out in jeans and a yellow t-shirt around 10 o'clock. And then, who knows? These were the facts. The cold, unemotional facts. If I was going to be able to help in any way, it would only be because I used the facts to do it. Her car was still in the driveway. None of the neighbors heard or saw anything. She didn't have a boyfriend. Her classmates hadn't had any contact. Her cell phone was plugged in on the table next to her bed. Facts. What about the police? The police had their hands full. They came out and did a report. Said that they'd be in touch if they found anything. What about Vanessa's mother? Well, that's where things get uncomfortable. My brother's widow had issues for a while. Losing her husband can just crank them up into a higher gear. She was taking meds for it, but there's only so much you can do for someone that doesn't want to be helped. Miranda had delusions and manic episodes. Some days her grasp on reality was more tenuous than others. I remembered some time after the funeral when Miranda confided in me that she didn't believe Vanessa was really her daughter. She was convinced that someone had come shortly after she was born, swapped her out with another baby. Her Vanessa, she said, was in outer space now and this thing that she was being forced to raise was secretly working for them. I may be a shitty uncle, but Miranda was an even shittier mother, and if there was a worst-case scenario, she was my suspect number one. But Jamie put that to rest. Miranda was off in another city, the same hospital she had been for nearly two years getting some much-needed help. He and Vanessa had been living pretty much on their own ever since. He was shocked that nobody had told me. Look... I finally said after I'd heard everything there was to tell, I know you think I can help, but I'm not sure I, I'm really qualified to do anything here. I've never worked a missing persons case before in my life. I can pay you, he said defensively. Look, I don't care about money, not right now. I just want to manage expectations. You know, the, you know the 48 hour rule, right? He nodded. Well, you also know that Vanessa is a smart kid, super smart. She just, she's most likely with somebody blowing off steam in the city. He nodded again. I don't know if I was being convincing or not. Comforting clients is the one thing I could never get right. And right now, I have to treat this like a case. Good. Imagine I said something I never should have. 
I'm going to find her. I promise. I made my first stop at the sheriff's station to check on the status of our investigation. The receptionist made me wait in the lobby for about half an hour, which I spent on my phone looking up any new and public information I could find about this place. It's remarkable how much knowledge is out there on the internet. The social media, everybody is an amateur reporter. Between that, the Freedom of Information Act, and the general delusion of news, there aren't really any secrets left anymore. Death records, police files, a veritable treasure trove of information plugging all of us into a shared consciousness and giving you whatever you want if you know where to look. And the reason I'm good at my job is I always know where to look. That's why I couldn't believe it, but all of my searches came up blank. This town had no footprint online. Now that's not just strange. That's impossible. With a town this small, in 30 minutes I should have been able to find who the mayor was banging. But I couldn't find an article about Vanessa. The sheriff will see you now, the receptionist said, snapping me back to reality. His name was Clyde. He was an older guy, bald on the top, and a smile that looked forced. The desk was clear, save for a single telephone, and the wall was covered in a giant, dirty American flag. He gestured for me to take a seat. Oh, what can I do you for? He asked. I explained the situation and asked him for the police reports concerning Vanessa's disappearance. I'm afraid I can't help you, he said. Miss Riggins' case is part of an ongoing investigation. Look, I'm not trying to break balls or get in the way here. I just want to help find my niece. The sheriff let out a long sigh and lost the smile dropping the facade. I knew that look from all the times that I had on my face. It was bad news that he didn't want to deliver. We had a lead on what happened to your niece. A bunch of kids went missing not too long ago, part of some neo-religious bullshit cult. We think maybe Vanessa got caught up in it somehow. Yeah? What are you thinking? No, we don't know. They had a suspect in custody. Jesus Christ. You don't think he murdered him, do you? The sheriff thought for a moment, came back with a thick file, dropping it on the desk in front of me. Everything we have is in there. Case got pretty fucking strange, we're still piecing it together. You look like a smart enough guy. I don't have to tell you. Yeah, you didn't give me this file. I don't know anything. Good. But if you do find anything, you'll know as soon as I do. I thanked him, and we shook hands before I left. Out in the lobby, I saw a couple deputies fixing themselves some coffee. I approached them and asked, Mind if I grab a cup? Knock yourself out, said the bigger one of the two. He was an intimidating figure, 6'2", built like a linebacker. The name on his pin said Williams. The smaller one was still taller than me, but lanky and young. Probably a fresh recruit. His pin said Franklin. Franklin folded his arms and sized me up. You some kind of reporter? He asked. No, not me. I'm Vanessa Riggins' uncle. Who? He asked. I gave them my best cold stare. Vanessa Riggins. The young woman that went missing a couple weeks ago? Franklin shrugged and said, Which one? Williams hit him in the chest. Show a little humanity, man. Sorry, I didn't mean... You know, we got the guy. I mean, he hasn't confessed to anything, but... It's fine, I said. Shitty town, shitty Leo's. Well, what are you planning to do? asked Williams. I'm retracing her last few days, I guess. I'll go check out the gas station where she worked. And when I said that, it was like the air was sucked out of the room. I've trained myself to watch reactions, to know when people are lying, but an idiot could see Franklin got pale. The hairs on his skin stood straight up, and he threw an awkward glance at the older cop. This rookie had no poker face. Williams tried to play it cool, but Franklin already blew that. Took a deliberate sip of coffee, tried to sound disinterested. Gas station at the edge of town, huh? You been out there yet? It's been a long time since I lived here, but I remember the stories. Something weird going on at the edge of town, where the woods are haunted and the creatures wait to eat you. I had no idea the stories were still persisting. Or, maybe not. Maybe this was something else. Not yet. Why? William searched for the words that would make sense, but obviously couldn't find them. Well, there's been reports of 
wild bear activity out there, just be careful, okay? Yeah, fuck you. If there's something going on, just tell me. We'll do, deputy. We'll do, deputy. My next stop was the town hall. Something about the glaring lack of information online about a mass disappearance really didn't sit right with me. Not surprisingly, the place was closed when I got there. By the looks of it, the place had been closed for a while. The front lawn was wild with weeds. Newspapers were piling up in various stages of decomposition by the front door. Somewhere, a public official was collecting a paycheck to do nothing. I know I said it before, but seriously, fuck this town. As long as I'm living in a pre-modern hellhole, I thought to myself, I may as well start working like it. The next stop was the old faithful for information gathering, the local library. Once again, I was hit with the sensation that this place I used to see all the time as a child must have gotten smaller since I was last here. But that smell, old books mixed with mildew, was pungent as ever. We found the librarian taking a nap at her station and asked her if the place kept records of local newspapers. She just laughed at me. Local papers? Here, have you seen this town? Only half of the people here are literate, and half of those are on meth. What newspaper do you think these people are buying? I apologized for wasting her time and turned to leave, but she told me to stop and come back. And she felt sorry for me. Hey, look, if you need information about this town, there is one guy who can help you. He's been around long enough, and he, he knows everything and everyone. She scribbled an address onto a piece of loose-leaf paper and gave it to me. When you get here, ask for Roger. He'll be able to help you. And here I was. On my way to my fifth stop today and exactly jack and shit to show for it. I wasn't any closer to figuring out what happened to Vanessa. If anything, I felt like I was further away, being pulled into this rabbit hole of bullshit weirdness. Was it even worth it to check out this Roger guy? When I got to my car, I took a second to center myself and think about it. Facts. Those are all I need right now. Facts. At this moment, I don't have what I need. Why not see what Roger knows? I plugged the address into my GPS and laughed to myself when I saw where I was going. My old high school building. It was just as horrible and broken down as it had been when I left. But nothing a few coats of paint couldn't cover. I wasn't sure what I was doing as I parked the car and went inside, but that state of blindly fumbling along, hoping for a clue, was turning into the theme of this trip. The school was small and dimly lit, and I could hear the buzz of the light on the ceiling just a few inches above my head. I felt like a giant in there. And I couldn't believe the children crammed themselves into this building. Hell, I was all by myself and feeling claustrophobic. Claustrophobic and a little dizzy. Yo, can I help you? At least I thought I was all by myself. I noticed the short guy in jeans and an ACDC t-shirt holding a mop, looking at me from inside of one of the classrooms. Yeah, I said, you work here? And nobody's supposed to be here, school's closed. I'm looking for Roger. The guy gently set his mop down, pulled out a pair of glasses and put them on for responding. Are you a friend of his? No, not exactly, I'm looking for my niece. She went missing. And you think Roger has something to do with that? Are you Roger? I asked directly. The man laughed. <laughs> no way. I wish. Well, if you don't mind pointing me in the direction. Roger's in his office. Uh, I'll show you how to get there. Yeah, great. The janitor walked slowly, and with a hunch, hand in pockets, eyes on the ground. He didn't say anything as he led me down the hallway, around a corner, and up to a closed door where he finally broke the silence. This is Roger's office. I thanked him. I waited for him to leave, but instead he knocked on the door and yelled, Hey Roger, there's a guy out here who wants to see you. From somewhere inside I heard a muffled, Go away! Now come on Roger, open up! He gave me an awkward smile and shrug. A few seconds passed before the janitor let out a sigh and grabbed the doorknob, opening it up and stepping inside. Guess if I had to pick the exact moment my case went from weird to batshit insane. It'd be this one. The room wasn't a room at all. It was simply a dirty supply closet, barely big enough for the janitor to fit inside, with shelves on every wall filled with cleaning supplies and boxes. The janitor flicked on the lights, bent down to the ground, and pulled up an old wooden crate that was in the center of the floor. 
Roger, are you in there? Didn't you hear what I said? You open the crate. And... Right, Jesus Christ, I can't even believe I'm saying this. He pulled Roger out of the box. Turned around and faced me, holding Roger in his arms. Roger was an old-fashioned wooden ventriloquist dummy with a black suit painted on. The eyes popped open and it looked at me, and then the head spun around to look at the janitor, then back at me. The dummy yawned and, and stretched and went through the show waking up before finally spoke. Who the hell is this guy? Didn't you see the sign on my door that said do not disturb? Roger's voice had a slight tinge of Bostonian accent. Couldn't help myself. What the fuck is this? I yelled. Some kind of stupid joke? My niece is missing! She could be dead for all I know, and you're playing games right now? It took a lot of self-control not to sock the janitor across the face. Instead, I just turned and started to walk away. Detective, wait! He yelled in his puppet voice. I stopped and I turned back. How did you know I was a detective? I asked. Oh, I know a lot of things, he said through the puppet. It was difficult listening to him because he refused to make eye contact, choosing instead to stare at the puppet, who was looking right at me. I had to give him credit, I couldn't see his lips moving at all. For instance, I know you drove here from New Orleans. You stopped by the sheriff's station and then the library, but they were no help. And now, you want answers about what happened to Vanessa. All right, I said. I'll bite. How do you know all that? The janitor refused to break character, saying everything to the doll. It's the details. The Beretta holstered under your jacket, the tactical boots, the haircut, and not least of all, the police report sticking out of your back pocket. I know you're not working directly with the sheriff's department because you haven't shaved in at least a week. So that says private eye. I know you hit up the library because the librarian's the only person that could possibly have known I was here. I know you're looking for Danessa Riggins because unlike some people, I keep up with the news. You say your niece is missing? Assuming neither of you are adopted, there's only one missing girl that shares any of your dominant features. All right, I said. The guy wasn't terrible. Maybe he had a few screws loose, but credit where it's due. He had the Sherlock shtick down pat. What about New Orleans? How'd you know I drove all night? Two reasons. First, you smell like you haven't had a shower in a couple of days. And second, I stole your wallet and looked at the address on your ID. He extended the wooden puppet arm and sure enough, the little bastard was holding my wallet. And to be honest, I wasn't even mad. This little shit got the jump on me. That's all it takes to earn my respect. I actually laughed. All right, Roger. How does this work? I pay you to be my research consultant? You believe it or not, said the puppet, I'm not big on money. What I deal in is information and favors. I can tell you don't have any of the former, so I'll take the latter. One favor, at the time of my choosing, and in return, I'll look at everything there is to find about what happened to your niece. When I get something, I'll call you. I shrugged. All right. Brian. Shake on it. Now I'm not proud to say this, but I shook hands with a the puppet. Then he gave me back my wallet. I finally got around to hitting up the gas station where Vanessa was working before her disappearance. And let me just say, what a shithole. From the outside, it looked like it hadn't been cleaned in weeks. When I walked in, I could smell fresh paint and raw sewage. The man behind the register was smoking a cigarette and stacking pennies into little pyramids, oblivious to my presence. It was right then that my tooth started hurting like hell. I grabbed a box of BC powder and walked up to the register. Hey, I said to the clerk. He was a young, lanky, blonde guy with blue eyes. Reminded me of what a golden retriever would look like in human form. His name tag said Jerry. He looked up and smiled at me. Hey! He said back, before returning all of his attention to the coin pyramid. I want to buy this, I said, getting a little annoyed. How much is it? Guy asked. I don't, I don't know. You're the one in the cash register. You tell me. He looked at the box, then at me. What's it worth to you? Look, man, 
I just want to buy this. I'm not trying to play a game here. Jerry scowled at the box and said, well, Just keep it. What? Yours, on the house. I sighed, put a $5 bill on the counter before heading to the bathroom for tap water to wash it down. I must have been distracted by the idiocy of the clerk, because I didn't even notice until I was already inside the bathroom that there was someone else in there. I went straight for the sink, turned on the faucet, and I heard it. Guitar music. I turned around to see a man standing next to the urinal, wearing nothing but a cowboy hat, red boxers, and boots, playing a familiar tune on the wooden guitar that was slung over his shoulder. Oh, shit, I said. <laughs> I didn't know it was occupied. The man started to sing along to the tune that he was playing. There is a house in New Orleans They call the rising sun Are you freaking kidding me? And it's been the ruin of many a poor boy And God, I know I'm one He turned, still playing and singing And he walked right out of the bathroom The fuck? I took two BC powders and I washed them down with a water that tasted especially metallic before I went back to the lobby. The clerk had lit another cigarette and the five dollar bill was still on the counter. What was that all about? I asked. What was what all about? The guitar playing guy and his boxers. Is some kind of act or something? Jerry looked around the store then back at me. Where? He was in the bathroom with me. Guy, a cowboy hat, uh, ring any bells? Oh, he said, that might have been the bathroom cowboy. Did he have a beard? No, that does sound like the bathroom cowboy. All right, look, I'm tired of playing games. I want to ask you some questions, is that okay? Jerry grinned. I like questions. Okay, there's a girl that used to work here named Vanessa. Did you know her? Oh, uh, I'm actually pretty new. You're probably going to want to talk to the other clerk, Jack. Okay. When does Jack come in? Oh, he should be here in an hour or so. You want some jerky? Jerry extended a half-eaten stick of jerky towards me. Before I could say hell no, the phone on Jerry's desk started ringing. He answered with a hello. After a second, he looked at me and asked, Are you Eric Riggins? That's weird. Yeah, it's for you. He handed me the receiver. <clears throat> uh, this is Eric. Mr. Riggins, this is Sheriff Clyde. I've been trying to reach you. Figured when your phone kept going to voicemail, you must be in the part of town without the reception. Is there a development? I asked. No, look. I don't know how you know Roger, but next time you see him, tell him that we're even. What do you mean? Roger's calling in his one favor. I know you've probably done interrogations before, right? Well, I'm, I'm giving you 20 minutes with the suspect that we have in custody. After that, you're done. Officially, this never happened. Come here before I change my mind. Wait, are you serious? I'm always serious. Uh, okay, I'm on my way. Uh, what's his name? Spencer Middleton. Spencer Middleton's hands were shackled to a steel eye plate that had been lazily welded onto the metal table in the center of the interrogation room. It was barely larger than Roger's supply closet. One light overhead, no window, two folding chairs, and a plastic camera tripod in the corner closest to the door. They had put him in an orange jumpsuit a couple sizes too big, and somebody had roughed him up pretty good. He had a swollen shiner on his left eye that blended into the purple bruises covering most of his face. When he saw me, he grinned. Hey, you don't look like a lawyer. You sure as hell ain't a cop. Well, let me guess. You're the newest one they sent to kill me. And it took a second to gain a sense of the man that I was about to talk to. The clock was ticking down 20 minutes, but those first brief moments set the trajectory it could make all the difference. Here I was, just a few feet away from the asshole that had probably killed my niece. I needed to figure out a way to pry information from him. I was coming into this with nothing. No carrot, no stick. 
And how do I trip him up? Maybe he'll give me just what I want out of the goodness of his heart. I'd done a little research on the drive over. Spencer was a local who had disappeared a while back and joined the army. After an honorable discharge, he made it a point to mostly live off the grid. Save for a handful of run-ins with the law. He had a habit of starting or ending fights, depending on how you look at it. Made my move. Returning his smile and pulling out the chair on the other side of the table, from here I could see that the man had a nasty-looking scar straight across his throat. I sat and I faced him, waiting to see if he had anything else to offer. He didn't. So I went first. Who's trying to kill you, Spencer? He laughed softly and said, <laughs> Hey, don't I know you? I doubt it. Yeah, I do. You went to my high school, right? You're Donnie's brother. I maintained my poker face best I could, bearing the sting of hearing the asshole mention my brother's name. It wasn't time yet to show my hand. He said I'm talking. Hey, you said somebody's out to kill you. Why would someone want you dead? You do something? You know, when I get out of here, I'm gonna cut your face open. From here, from across the table, he pointed at the spot just over my right eye. To here. He dragged the point of his finger slowly down towards my neck. Take a long breath. But I'm not a cop, or a lawyer. Just an interested third party. Yeah, sure. There's a lot of those in this town, aren't there? What do you mean by that? Spencer relaxed in his chair and leaned his head back to stare at the ceiling. Man, come on. Just ask me whatever it is you came to ask, alright? Starting to think you might not know anything. Maybe the sheriff oversold you as some kind of badass when really you're just a guy. A guy that was in the wrong place and too dumb not to look guilty. Spencer looked me in the eye. He laughed a short staccato kind of laugh. <laughs> You can use pride and ego down on me, Riggin. This ain't amateur hour. I spent years on the other side of this. I've interrogated Al-Qaeda in a cave in the desert. Shit. And this asshole had my number. Look. I'm not gonna bullshit you. Quit trying to work around it and ask me the fucking question you came here to ask me. This asshole was running the show now. We both knew it. Might as well take a shot. You know what happened to my niece? Vanessa. Spencer held up both palms. Is that supposed to be a no? I asked. That's supposed to be a let's make a deal, Clarice. Quid pro quo, right? All right. What do you want, Dr. Lecter? And more importantly, what are you offering? I can tell you exactly where a certain missing teenage girl went. Where you can find her and you can ask her yourself what happened. I can draw you a fucking map if you want. In exchange, I want something from you. Something small. Something you won't ever miss. My heart was pounding. It took every bit of restraint I had not to just jump across the table and strangle the answers I wanted out of him. Okay, I said. Name your price. Spencer leaned in and spoke each syllable deliberately. I want one of your teeth. He smiled and laughed again. What the fuck did you just say? It's all I want. I want you to pick a tooth, any tooth. Let's pull it out for me. You got dozens, right? You gonna miss one? I don't think so. You pull out a tooth for me. That's exactly where you can find her. No, if you burn in hell, you piece of shit. Really? You value your teeth more than your own family. <laughs> Good thing your brother isn't alive to see you make this choice. I knew he was baiting me. And I wish I had been smarter, but I wasn't. I jumped out of my chair so fast it launched across the room and swung a wild right hook that would have broken bone if it had landed, but he dodged it by an inch caught me by the fist and used my follow-through to pull me across the table. My face hit the metal and before I knew it, he had hooked his arm under my chin. In a single motion, he twisted me onto my back and locked his arm against my windpipe, squeezing tighter and tighter until I started to black out. I tried to scream, but there was no way air was coming in or going out and the world went black. 
I knew I was done for. That son of a bitch was faster and stronger than I could have expected, and I'm glad I'm more lucky than careless. I didn't hear the deputies come in, but if they had waited a few more seconds to pull me away, well, I might not be here right now. As they helped me out of the room, Spencer let out a loud, gleeful cackle that followed me all the way into the lobby. It was getting dark by the time I patched up and was leaving the sheriff's station. I had decided to spend the rest of the day getting shit-faced, that asshole, all but confessed to killing Vanessa, but that wasn't enough. He wanted to, he needed to, rub it in my face. And I let him. I had the who. It's not the how, where, or the why. For a guy like that, do we even need to be a why? Armed with this information, I wasn't exactly in a hurry to go back to see Jamie. The only bar in town was closed with some kind of bullshit holiday, so I decided to celebrate alone. The bottle in my go bag might not be enough, I thought. So I went back to that shitty gas station. The one on the edge of town. The sheriff was pissed at me for what had happened. I didn't blame him. I lost my cool. You can't do that if you're working on the side of the law, which for the time being I was. Couldn't help but wonder how hard it would be to get away with killing Spencer while he was in custody. When I got to the gas station, the clerk behind the counter didn't even look up from the book he was reading. He was considerably younger than me, with bags under his eyes like he hasn't slept in days. A pair of crutches were laying on the counter next to him. Bought a bottle of whiskey and a pack of smokes. As he rung them up, I asked, Hey, you know a good hotel near here? No, he said simply as he handed me my change and went back to his book. All right. Thank you, Mr. Personality. When I got back to my car, I tried to look up the nearest place at the cheap hotel. I was reminded that this part of town doesn't get cell or internet service. All I wanted to do at that moment was drink and shower and sleep, and after a few minutes of thinking about it, I decided I could do with two out of the three. After getting sufficiently inebriated, I put my seat into a reclined position, and I fell into a deep, dreamless sleep. I woke up the next morning, still a little drunk to the sound of my cell phone ringing. When I checked the caller ID, I couldn't understand what I was seeing. Donnie. Cell. It rang a couple more times while I sat up and tried to wrap my head around the moment. Where was I again? My car? What happened yesterday? The weight of it all came crashing back into place in an instant. Vanessa's killer was sitting in a cell somewhere laughing at me. The phone continued to ring. I looked again, but this part still didn't make any sense. Who was calling me from my brother's phone? And how? I answered. Hello? Hey, Eric. It's been a while, huh? What the fuck? What the fucking fuck? Who is this? I'm not sure how long I've got. I've been trying to get through to one of you for a long time. I asked you a question. Who is this? You know who this is, Eric. My brother's dead. And when I find you, I'm gonna make sure that you are too. Always gotta be the badass, huh? Remember Merlin? Merlin. I hadn't thought about him in a long time. When we were kids, sometimes we would play superheroes. We'd take turns being the bad guy. I always wanted to be Batman or Wolverine, but Donnie. Donnie always wanted to be a wizard named Merlin. He started his own mythology around the character. A time-traveling wizard that rode a motorcycle. When I got a little too old to play make-believe, he started drawing comics about the guy. I never told him, but I found them. I read a few. They were impressive. Anybody could know about Merlin. Did anybody know I stole a car in my junior year, but you took the blame for it? A chill ran down my spine. Suddenly the car felt, felt way too cramped for me. I opened up the door. I tried to step out, but a dizzy spell almost put me on my ass. I held onto the roof of the vehicle until it passed, and I put the phone back to my ear. Who is this? I told you. It's me. Tell me the truth. You're looking for Vanessa? You've got to find her. Look, okay, I watched my brother die. I saw his body get put in the ground. I died. And then they came for me. And they put me here. Where is here? I don't know. But I do know that they're watching you. They've been watching you ever since you came back. I think they haven't decided what they're going to do with you yet. They're both running out of time. You have to get to Vanessa before they get to you. No, and tell my kids I love them. There was a loud crackle from a phone, and then it disconnected. 
I stared at the screen like an idiot for way too long. Then did the only thing I could think of. I dialed the number back. At that exact moment, I heard a cell phone ring from somewhere just beyond the gas station. Son of a bitch is here. I ran back towards the sound of the ringing. It was hard to pinpoint exactly where it started, but I knew it was coming from somewhere in the woods, beyond the tree line. I ran straight into the forest, making a mental note on the way to check out that large, fresh mound of dirt next to the dumpster. It looked like something had been buried there recently, but I couldn't afford the distraction just yet. How many times had it rung? It was four, five... The ringing continued, now somewhere much deeper in the woods. I followed, trying to determine exactly where the noise was coming from. As I ran further in, the ringing became more of an echo all around me. I checked the phone still in my hand and saw the message. No network detected. Emergency calls only. The ringing got louder. Then it turned into something else. No longer ringing, more like a loud chirping, like an insect of some kind. And it morphed into a deafening noise. Somewhere between a roar and a scream all around me. I pocketed the phone and instinctively reached for my piece. It wasn't there. I left it in the car. Right, look, I know how this sounds, okay? It's, it's crazy. I'm not going to pretend that it isn't, but it only got worse. The temperature in the spot started to crank up like I was next to an invisible fire ready to consume the entire forest. I had the sensation that I was burning up and about to be cooked alive. And my fight or flight response kicked in on overdrive. I picked a direction and started running as fast and as hard as I could. The heat got further and further away as I jumped over logs, limbs, and ditches and finally caught a clearing. My lungs were ready to explode by the time I stopped and collapsed to my knees. I threw up. I didn't have long to relax before I heard something crunching through the forest in front of me. I pushed myself to my feet and I scanned the area for any kind of weapon, but there wasn't anything worth grabbing. Not a rock or a decent stick or even a tree nearby worth hiding behind. But uh, what was I thinking running out here in the middle of this clearing? I was in the dead center of a nearly perfect circle the size of a tennis court. No trees, only knee-high grass, basically a sitting duck. And I saw it. A bear at the edge of the trees, right in front of me. I saw that it was a bear. I say that it was a bear that I saw, which is technically true, but also not. It looked at me, and I was convinced that I had lost my mind and gone crazy, because in that moment, nothing made any damn sense. The thing I was looking at was, best I can tell, uh, an enormous grown man, nearly seven feet tall, wearing a tan teddy bear costume, complete with an enormous felt head and had black button eyes the size of saucers, like some kind of school mascot from a nightmare. It was covered in dirt and leaves, and when it saw me, it started waving excitedly. Uh... Hey, I said uncertainly. And then it turned both its middle fingers up to me and did a little dance. Uh, hey man, I'm, I'm kind of lost. The bear didn't say anything. It just pointed at me. And then in its crotch, it started pelvic thrusting in the air. God. I wish I had my gun right now. I woke up suspended off the ground in a small dark room with that ever so familiar feeling of not knowing where the hell I was. The walls were covered in shelves packed with cleaning supplies, paper products, and canned goods. When I tried to sit up, the world shook and swung under me. I a few tries before I realized that I was being held up by a braided rope hammock. You're awake, asked a voice to my right. I turned and saw the gas station clerk from earlier, Jerry, sitting on a milk crate and smiling. I tried to sit up, but pain shot through my leg like electricity. I fell back into the hammock. Where am I? What happened? Did, did you paint my nails? I looked at the nail polish on my right hand. Then Jerry. Do you like it? No. Okay, that's fair. You're more of a fire truck than a cherry red anyway, but I, I thought I'd take a chance. I looked at the source of the pain in my leg and I saw that it had been wrapped tightly in a makeshift duct tape cast that wrapped right around my pant leg. That's when it all came back to me. A bizarre memory that wouldn't have been out of place in a David Lynch fever dream. I reached out, grabbed Jerry by the collar of his shirt, and yanked him close to me. I need to talk to the sheriff. Now. 
The man in the bear costume stayed there on the other side of the clearing, spinning his arms and legs in a bizarre dance like a PCP Jack teenager at the disco, occasionally looking my way as if to make sure that I was still watching. I slowly started to back up, putting one foot behind the other, carefully adding to the distance between us. I didn't know the score, but I sure as hell didn't want to push my luck. Once I got back to my car, I could call the sheriff, have him bring all his deputies in an extra large straitjacket. That plan required that I first get back to my car. I had my eyes locked on the bear man, so I saw exactly when the arrow whipped right through him. Came from somewhere in the forest behind him, entered his bear suit from the back just below the armpit and passed straight through the other side towards me. I didn't have either the time or the reflexes to dodge. The next thing I knew, I had been struck. I hit the ground and the man in the bear costume grabbed his wound and danced his way back into the woods. The arrow had lodged itself deep into my leg, a few inches above the knee with the light wooden shaft protruding straight out. It was the single most painful thing I had ever experienced, and sheer adrenaline is probably the only reason I wasn't going right into shock. Two men, donned head to toe in camouflage and carrying hunting bows, stepped into the clearing at the same spot where the bear man had emerged. They both had shades of green smeared all over their faces like war paint. The fat one was cursing and yelling when he emerged. I screamed, partially to get their attention, and partially because I couldn't help it. Oh shit, yelled the skinny one. Did we get you? He dropped his bow and ran over to me while the fat one put his own on a sling on his shoulder and slowly walked over to join us. Who the fuck are you? Asked the fat one. The skinny one pulled an eight inch knife out of its sheath on his belt and sliced open my pant leg around where the arrow had lodged. I took a look and wished I hadn't. You shot me, I yelled. It was about the only thing I could muster the strength to say besides the lengthy paragraphic expletives that I couldn't hold in if I tried. The skinny one looked at me defensively. Well, hell, dude, we didn't expect no people but us to be out here. The bear's gone away by now, boy, complained the fat one. You think you can walk? I didn't answer right away. The shaft of the arrow was shaking with my pulse, and I knew it was embedded into my femur. The fat man knelt down for a closer look and whistled. That's in there, all right. I closed my eyes and tried to focus on anything but the pain. Every breath, every heartbeat, every micro-movement radiated through the arrow like an antenna into the wound and down into the nerve in my leg. My eyes shot open and I let out a scream. The fat one had reached out and grabbed the arrow at the base with his other hand and he grabbed the top and snapped the shaft off. I collapsed onto my back and I stared up into the sky, hoping that the pain had just knocked me out already. There, said the hunter. Now we don't have to worry about it snagging on every little thing. Nick, help me get into the four-wheeler. The other one, Ned, pulled me to my feet and together we walked back into the woods. I kept an arm over both of their shoulders and basically hanging on and letting my bad leg drag the whole way. Not too far into the forest there was a small trail that we followed for close to half a mile before we reached the four-wheeler. I don't remember the ride back to their truck but I remember them smacking me on the face when we got there to make sure that I was still alive. Y'all got him? Asked the fat woman sitting in the driver's seat of the white extended cab truck stained brown from countless layers of dried mud. The fat man got out of the four-wheeler and answered, No, nah, he got away. I clipped him, though, bragged Ned as he jumped down from the four-wheeler. Left a blood trail. May be able to get to him. Oh, you shut up, boy. We ain't going nowhere tonight. Gotta get home before the sun goes down. The woman looked at me and smiled a big toothless smile, her bright red cheek standing out against her pale skin like she had already had a few drinks too many. Oh, you got something, though. That one grabbed me by the hair and yanked me off the four-wheeler, throwing me to the ground. I let out another scream. What the fuck is wrong with you? You crazy? That thing out there isn't a bear, it's a person. And you assholes shot me. I need to get to a hospital, for Christ's sake. That man looked at the woman and said, Yeah, and that got this one by accident. Well, that ain't a total loss, then, she said back. Why is he still alive? They're easy to move when they're alive. And they taste better if they're scared when you put them down. Ned let out a whoop and jumped down on top of me, pushing my face into the ground and yanking in my pockets. He managed to dig out my phone, wallet, and keys before I finally had a handful of dirt and smacked it into his eyes. He fell off me and I jumped to my feet, running towards the safety of the forest when BAM! Froze. Now I won't be too keen on running back out there if I were you. With my hands in the air and slowly turn around to face the fat one pointing a 45 at me, from what I would consider point-blank range. Close enough that I could recognize it as a Dan Wesson specialist. 
These guys were bow hunting for sport, but smart enough to bring along something heavier just in case. Smarter than me. That's for sure. Why not? I asked. I doubt there's anything out there as bad as right here. Well, that's where you're wrong. Ooh, hooed the woman from back in the truck. Shoot him! Shoot him! Shut up, woman. I ain't about to shoot him just because you said so. I know, I said softly. Suddenly the pain in my leg didn't seem so bad. Let's talk about this for a second. You don't have to kill me. I don't know you from Adam. You can just leave me here. We just forget all about this. Ned reached out for the gun and said, Let me do it! You got to do the last one! Fat one sighed and handed the gun over. Fine, but aim careful. One shot, one kill. Oh, wait, wait! I screamed. I, I know where the bear is. I can, I can take you to him. He's lying, whined the woman. No, I'm not. We're friends. Hell, why the hell else would I be out there in the middle of nowhere uh, with the bear? Ned gave the fat man a what now look, and the fat man scrunched up his face as he thought about it. Okay, he finally said. Take us to him. Then maybe we'll let you go. Maybe. One gun, two hunting knives, two bows, a quiver of arrows. I erased every scenario through my mind quickly. How do I get to one of their weapons without getting killed first? Forest, four-wheeler, truck. Is there any realistic way to escape without being shot in the back? We weren't looking good. But I was still breathing for the time being. It'll be faster if we, uh, we take the truck. The hunters were being smarter than I would have liked. The big one, I picked up his name was Paul, put me in the back seat of the cab next to Ned. He threw all the weapons, knives included, into the truck bed and climbed into the back with us. I was sandwiched with Ned to my right, Paul to my left, in that tiny vehicle that smelled like shit. Literally. It smelled like human feces. The seats were torn up and wet. I saw a few small roaches scurry away from us. After Paul slammed the door shut, a tiny face looked back at me from the passenger seat. A little girl with matted blonde hair, no older than ten. She smiled and said, Are we going to eat this one? <laughs> Probably said the fat woman as she cranked the engine. Which way? asked Paul. I pointed straight ahead. Get up here on the main road, take a right. You better not be trying nothing, warned Paul. We hit the main road and the truck climbed up a slow 30 miles per hour. Go straight for about a mile, I said. You'll see a dirt road on the left. <laughs> Ain't no dirt road, squealed the fat woman in a high-pitched voice. I know these roads like the back of my hand. I ain't remember no dirt road up there. Paul punched me hard in the stomach. You think you're being funny, boy? He knocked the wind out of me. I doubled over in the seat as they all started laughing maniacally. There's an expression in trapping called ring off, which is much worse than the phrase implies. If you're unfamiliar with the term, allow me to explain. Trappers have to check their traps frequently because if they don't, an animal's survival instinct will kick in and they'll free themselves. One way or the other. The most common form of ringing off is a coyote or jaguar or anything with sharp enough teeth chewing through its own legs to free itself. That ain't pretty, but it sure beats the alternative, right? Well, in that moment, I understood exactly how those trapped animals felt. I bit down hard on the exposed piece of wooden arrow shaft as hard as I could stand, and I yanked it out as fast as I could. For the second time in as many hours, I experienced the single most painful thing I'd ever felt. But now, the arrow was free from my leg. I had a weapon. I spit the broken arrowhead into my left hand and stabbed it into Paw's neck, cutting his laughter into a muffled gurgle. No oh, shit! yelled Ned as I swung myself into the seat, and I planted the foot of my good leg against the side of his face with as much force as I could muster. I pushed his head into the glass of the window, all the while holding onto the arrow that was still embedded in Paw's neck. The little girl started screaming, and the fat woman turned around to see what the fuss was about. I turned to her, and I noticed it. Maybe a hundred feet ahead, the man in the bear costume, stepping out of the woods, and crossing the road. I closed my eyes, and I braced for impact. She must have looked back and seen the bear, because the truck lurched wildly to one side, then back to the other. Like she had swerved to miss, then overcorrected. Then we started rolling. The sound of the crash was like an explosion. Pieces of broken glass and blood rained down all around me as my head hit the roof, then the seat, then the door, and finally, the world stopped spinning and I was on my back with blood stinging my eyes. A warm hand reached under me and dragged me out of the wreckage and twisted mass of bodies and debris through the cold, wet grass and through a ditch. 
then dropped me into the road. I wiped my eyes and looked up at the giant black buttons of the man in the bear costume. He waved at me, gave me an excited double thumbs up before walking back to the truck, and zipping the fly of the bear suit and pissing all over the wreckage. He did a little jig off in the woods. That was the last I saw of him. What the fuck was happening? I checked the truck. The driver, Ned, and Paul were all dead. The little girl was nowhere to be found. I know if she had survived, it's unlikely that I'd have any luck finding her. The weapons were gone too, probably flung out in the crash, and even though I would have felt a lot safer packing, it wasn't worth the time that it would take to track them down. I made a quick bandage out of my shirt sleeve and wrapped it around my leg tight enough to slow the bleeding. I found a fallen branch long and strong enough to serve as a walking stick, and I started up the road in the direction of the gas station. I must have been a hell of a sight when I got back there. I was torn up and bleeding from several wounds. None of them seemed to create a sense of care, and the clerk down the register still didn't even have the decency to look up from his damn book. I walked over to him and knocked on the counter, finally drawing his attention. I don't know what it takes to impress this guy, but the sight of me and my near-to-death sure as hell didn't register with him. Look, I need your phone. He tapped a small cardboard sign that was sitting on the counter. In sloppy black sharpie, someone had written the message that you would like to use the store phone. It's 25 cents per minute. Please pay in advance. There's no exceptions. I reached for my wallet, only to remember that it wasn't on me. Ned had taken it and left it somewhere out in the woods. Look, asshole, this is a life or death situation, okay? It's, there's been an accident. I need to call a sheriff. I spun the cardboard sign to the other side where someone had written, no exceptions means no exceptions. Not even life or death situations. Thank you for understanding, sign management. Now under normal situations, I would have resorted to a more physical solution, but at that moment, at that moment I started to feel lightheaded and dizzy. The next thing I knew, I was, I was swinging in a hammock with my nails painted. Where am I? I repeated the question to Jerry. Oh, you're in the gas station dry supply closet. Why? Well, because customers were complaining that they, they didn't want to keep stepping over you every time that they wanted to buy something. But don't worry. I already called the deputy that babysits us. She's on her way here to arrest you, or, or uh, whatever she does. And in the meantime, Jack says you can borrow one of his old crutches. To be continued. Jerry held out a bottled water, and I took him down the whole thing in one pull, then forced myself up from the hammock. I need to get out of here. There was an accident. People are dead. <laughs> cool, he said. But you probably shouldn't go anywhere until O'Brien shows up. I ignored him. I left the closet on my own two feet. The pain in my leg was... It was bad, but bearable. I'd rather power through than borrow someone's spare crutches. When I stepped into the store, the combination of natural and fluorescent lights stung my eyes and gave me the realization that I had absolutely no idea what time it was. Is that him? I looked at where the voice was coming from to see a woman in a deputy uniform staring right at me. She was tall and attractive, dark skinned with hair pulled back into a ponytail and a look on her face that said, don't even think about fucking with me. She had been leaning against the counter next to the cashier, the one with all the books. He looked over at me and whispered something to her that I couldn't make out, which caused her to stand up straight and put her right thumb in her belt next to her gun holster. I've seen that tick before. She was trigger happy, and ready to put me down if she needed to. Mr. Riggins, she asked. I stood perfectly still and put my hands in front of me in the least intimidating way I could, remembering that I still had fresh red nail polish on my fingernails. Officer, I said. She took a second, probably trying to figure out what kind of lunatic she was dealing with. In an effort to get in front of the whole thing, I tried to explain the situation. There's been an accident. I wanted to give a statement, but I've been attacked and I require medical assistance. She cocked her head slightly to one side and said, You look fine to me. Yeah, bullshit, I do. I was in the truck when it flipped. What truck? Are you fucking with me right now? Shit, too much. Now her fingers were on the gun, ready to pull. I needed to reel it in a little. After a long, deliberate, loud breath, I said, Sorry, officer, I'm a little shaken up because I was in an accident. The vehicle I was in went off the road. And it flipped. 
You were in an accident. Yes. Was anybody hurt? Was anybody hurt? That was, that was unexpected. How long had I been unconscious? There was no possible way they hadn't found the wreck and the, and the bodies by now. Which meant she was either screwing with me or testing me. Now, if it was the latter, then why? Was she trying to trip me up? Get me to contradict my own story? That's when it hit me. This was an interrogation. There were bodies. Victims, now. And someone was going to hang for it. I had to choose my next words very carefully. Yeah. Yeah, three people died in the wreck. I came straight here to call the police, but the blood loss knocked me out before I could. I I could take you right to where it all happened. She took a step towards me, just one, putting herself between me and the cashier. And that's interesting, I thought. If I hadn't been paying attention, I might have missed it, but her body language was telegraphing a clear message. That was an unknown, a potential threat. And her priority in this situation was protecting the guy behind the counter. What was even more interesting was that what she didn't do. All right, Mr. Riggins. We'll take my car and you can show me exactly where this all went down. Sound good? It was only then that I noticed her soft Brooklyn accent. Now, one thing was for sure. She she wasn't local. I'd have to look her up once I got back to my phone or someplace with the internet. Yeah, yeah. That sounds okay. She gestured towards the door and let me lead the way. Her hand never leaving the gun until we were both outside. She didn't call it in. Now, I had just informed her that there were dead bodies. She didn't radio dispatch, backup, EMTs, anybody. There was one obvious reason why that would be the case. She must have already known about the wreck. I saw our cruiser in the spot furthest from the doors, parked backwards in the spot for a fast getaway. I stepped around the passenger side and looked back at her, half expecting to see her pull the gun and take me down right there. But now that we were outside, she seemed instantly calmer. Well? She asked. What are you waiting for? The door's unlocked. She opened the driver's side and took her spot behind the wheel. She isn't going to make me ride in the back seat? That's good. I think. I took my spot in the passenger side and instantly put on my seatbelt. But before I could even click it into place, O'Brien had the car pulled onto the road. Which way? I pointed back in the direction I had come, downhill, away from town. She peeled out and gunned the vehicle. I watched the side of the road for any sign of the bear or the little girl, but at the speed she was driving, I doubt that I had been able to pick out anything that wasn't right next to the street. We passed the dirt road and led to the family's hunting ground. I made a mental note to come back later and find out where Ned had left my wallet and keys. Should be right up here, around the bend. I replayed the event in my mind. Straight for a mile, I see a dirt road on the left. Paul punching me in the gut. Their perverse laugh. The arrow. Stab. Screams. The bear. All right, slow down. You should be right. O'Brien slowed the car and hit the red and blues. We were right on top of where the truck had gone off the road. And there was... Nothing. Where? She asked. Stop the car. I hopped out before she had even come to a complete stop on the shoulder of the road. I ignored the stinging in my leg as best I could. This... this wasn't possible. I couldn't have been unconscious that long. They... they had already moved the truck. I ran into the grass and stood in the exact spot where I had been pulled from the mangled wreck earlier that day. But there was nothing there. No sign of any wreckage. No blood, no debris, no ruts in the dirt. Not a single blade of grass out of place. O'Brien yelled out to me from her spot next to the cruiser. Now, I don't think it's out here. Maybe we should head up the roadways. It all looks the same to me. No, no, I'm, I'm certain it was right here. Well, it's not right here anymore. So how about we get you back into town and you can give a statement? I took a deep breath, caught an all too familiar aroma. When glaringly out of place on the side of the road near a thick forest, bleach. I scanned the grass for something, anything that would that would prove that I hadn't imagined it all. I walked up the road for a better look. From there, I scanned both directions. No skid marks, no nothing. This wasn't a, 
pull the wreck out of the woods operation. This was a, a hardcore cleanup crew. Somebody, somebody had put a hell of a lot of effort into covering it up, but why? Does this street look like it's been cleaned recently? I asked. O'Brien scoffed by the way of an answer. I crossed the opposite side of the road and I knelt down. Pretty sure there's not a wreck over there either, nail polish. Whoever did this had resources that I couldn't barely even fathom. This, this would have taken money, manpower, precision, but even the most thorough cleanup crews would make mistakes when time is a factor. I, I reached into the grass, I picked up a tiny shard of broken safety glass. An old silver pickup truck pulled up behind the deputy cruiser, and again, I reached for the empty spot on my right side like a phantom limb. I kept expecting to find my handgun, only to remember that I'm as vulnerable as when that family were arguing over who got to kill me. The man stepped out of the truck and came around to face us with a big, friendly smile. He was late fifties with a dirty white beard and a camo jacket, a tucked in white shirt that showed off a pot belly spilling over the edge of his jeans. Morning, he said to me, basically ignoring O'Brien. It's still morning? I hadn't actually seen a clock since I woke up. There's no way all this could have could have been cleaned up in just a few hours. Hey, he said back. He laughed and said, You look like shit. What happened? I cut myself shaving. He finally acknowledged O'Brien with the simplest flash of eye contact before looking back at me and asking, Y'all lose something? But before I could answer, his cell phone started ringing. And he put out a finger and dug it into his pocket. Yeah. His look turned into one of slight confusion before he lowered it. Took a look around, then at the phone, then at O'Brien and me. Then he said, Is one of you Eric Riggins? Talked at O'Brien, who shook her head and laughed softly. <laughs> Don't look at me. Uh, I'm Eric. It's, uh, it's for you. Put the glass shard in my pocket, and I walked over to the man extending his phone. The whole situation was too much for my brain to digest. I genuinely had no idea what was going on, who to trust, or even what was real anymore. That's when I first noticed that my tongue was feeling extra fat. A warm sensation was pouring over me. And I could have just been an effect of the blood loss, but somehow this, this felt different. I decided to ignore the feeling for now, and I reached out for the phone. Now, this is Eric. Finally! Where the hell have you been all day? Of all the possible voices I expected to hear on the other side of that line, this was not one of them. Roger? Who the hell were you expecting, Santa Claus? How did you find me? I know things, Detective. Time to take a little bit of face, all right? I know the investigation got a little derailed this morning. Somebody's screwing with you, which is a good sign. They're trying to throw you off the scent before you're asking questions, and they, they aren't used to people in this town asking questions. You kicked their hornet's nest, and they're pissed off. I leaned away from O'Brien, and I whispered the stuck's part into the phone. Roger. I was attacked. People are dead. Really? You didn't sound all that impressed. Well, we're definitely going to have to talk about that later. For now, though, I found something in the Vanessa's file that we need to discuss. You got a gun, right? Uh, yeah, somewhere. Ditch it. Drop it in the bottom of the ocean if you have to. I guarantee by now, they've tied the ballistics in one or two of the open murder cases in town. <sighs> Look, tell, tell me one thing. What the hell's going on? Lose the coffer. I, I don't know who to trust yet. And meet me at the bowling alley tonight at 8. Oh, come alone. Uh, pay attention, because you'll probably need to shake a tail. And, detective? Yeah? Take a shower. With that, we disconnected. I looked at O'Brien, who was leaning against the truck of her car. Arms crossed and watching me. Who was that? She asked. I handed the phone back to the man and shrugged at the deputy. It looks like I made a huge mistake. Yeah? She said incredulously. Yeah, I answered. 
She gave me a ride back to the gas station while I spun a yarn about having a serious case of sleepwalking. I assured her that I had dreamt the whole thing up. And I must have gone off into the woods in my unconscious state, gotten myself scraped up pretty bad, then I must have wandered back into town confused. And a little worse for the wear. Neither she bought my story or she had her own reasons to accept that there was no reason to press it further. It didn't strike me as an idiot. So I concluded that it must have been the latter. She brought me to my car, gave me a straightforward warning, before she took off. I don't know what answers you think you're going to find, but I wouldn't stick around much longer if I were you. We got the guy who killed Vanessa. Take it from me. Closure? It's overrated. It's B. Continued. The first thing I did after she took off was check my car to see if I might have left some spare change somewhere. I figured I could probably dig up enough coins out of the floorboards to get me a bite to eat before hotwiring the vehicle. I was only a little surprised to see my phone, wallet, and keys sitting on the passenger seat waiting for me. My head was spinning, and I desperately needed something in my stomach, even if it was only gas station food. I did a quick run up and down the aisles collecting whatever foodstuffs didn't look like they'd make me throw up. A bag of trail mix, some chips, a stick of jerky, and a Gatorade. And I brought them to the counter where the cashier, Jack, was typing something up on a laptop. I knocked the counter to get his attention. He looked up from what he was doing with a smile and said, Huh, found your wallet, huh? I dropped the stuff in front of him and answered. Go figure. He rang it up and I paid. Then he went back to his computer. I didn't feel like waiting any longer, so I opened the chips right there, and then had a small heart attack when hundreds of tiny spiders poured out of the opening in the bag. They were tiny, black, and crawling over one another in each direction. I dropped it onto the ground and started stomping them all under my boot. What the holy fuck? I yelled at the cashier. He looked back at me and raised his eyebrows and asked, What? Did, did you not see that? There was... Right then I lost all ability to speak. There was something in the store with us. Something impossible. Another spider was crawling up the wall behind the cash register. Only this one wasn't tiny. This one was at least the size of a Rottweiler. Shiny black legs as thick as, as walking sticks and a pulsing black abdomen. I could see the reflection of the fluorescent light on its bulging wet black eyes. And I could make out clear as day the thick needle-like hairs covering its body crawled all the way up the wall, then turned upside down on the ceiling and started towards me. I grabbed the spot on my side where my gun should have been and fell backwards into a display of pork rinds landing on my ass. My voice finally came back to me and I screamed, What the fuck is that thing? Jack clearly hadn't seen it yet. What? It was crawling slowly but steadily on the ceiling overhead. I waited quietly for it to move past me, never looking away, and only after it had crawled all the way to the other side of the store, I whispered, did you see that? Jack followed my eyes up to the ceiling and then looked back at me. What, is, is, it a, is it a giant spider? Yes! What the fuck? No. The spider stayed at a constant speed and crawled back down the wall on the other side of the store near the coolers, but I lost sight of it behind the rows of groceries. I jumped to my feet and I took a few steps to the side, trying to find out where the thing had gone to, but it wasn't there anymore. I looked back at Jack, who was not reacting to the situation the way that I would have expected. Or, or really at all. What do you mean, no? I whispered, screamed. He sighed deeply and yelled out, Marlboro! I'm here for a second! Who are you talking to? He stretched casually and closed his laptop, then looked at me in the eyes and said, It's the pain meds they gave me. I had to stop taking them because they were making me see spiders. What? I know, right? Weirdest side effect ever, but apparently, it's a thing. Brand-specific hallucinations, spiders everywhere. When I ate, when I slept, I decided the pain wasn't as bad as spiders in my cereal. Wait, you drugged me? No, I didn't. The door from the storage closet opened and the clerk from earlier, the one that had painted my nails, came out drinking a beer. You rang? He yelled. The cashier answered. Did you give this guy my old pain meds? Oh, most definitely, he answered. I ground up like four, put him in his water bottle. My heartbeat was finally starting to come back down to normal, the adrenaline spike slowly being replaced by pure, undulating rage. 
I tried to hold it together and ask as calmly as possible. Why would you do that? He smiled and shrugged and said, Just trying to help. Rub my eyes and took a deep breath. If, if he had been a little closer, I probably would have slugged him. Thankfully, I managed to keep my cool. This is so fucked. Hey, man, uh, you all right? Asked the cashier. What part of this looks all right to you? I responded. Yeah, I uh, figured as much. Uh, you're Vanessa's uncle, right? Yeah, that's right. Did you know her? Um, a little? I guess she was, she was a decent worker. She always showed up on time, never stole anything. I was bummed out when she disappeared. That's what I hate to ask. But do you, you know what happened to her? Maybe it was the drugs? But I was having trouble getting a read on this guy. Was he for real? I'm planning on finding that out. I take it you don't buy the story about her joining a cult? I caught the quickest micro-expression when I said cult. He looked at the other worker for just a moment, then back at me. No, I, I don't think she joined the cult. There was something else going on here. I asked him directly, What exactly do you think happened? I don't know. The other worker piped in with, Maybe a demon got her. Cashier looked at him and said, What, like in Twin Peaks? Dude, spoilers! That show has been out for 20 years. Either you're going to watch it or you're not. This was pointless. The two were using each other for deflection, and if I was going to find out what either of them knew, I'd need to separate them. And the question is how? Right then, the cashier leaned back and grabbed his crutches off the wall and said, Marlboro, take these for me. Going to lunch. Okie dokie, said Jerry. Or Marlboro. Or whatever the hell his name actually was. He struck me as the kind of guy who would find somebody else's name tag and wear it just because. Hey, I said after the cashier just stood up, how about I take you to lunch? He looked at me for an awkward couple of seconds and asked, why would you do that? I want to ask you some questions. About Vanessa? I really didn't know her that well. About this town. I'll pay for your lunch. What do you say? He mulled over the offer for a few more silent seconds and nodded said, okay. I checked my phone during the drive just to see what time it was. 12.05 p.m. Then I tossed it out the window. Even if they hadn't bugged it, there was no way in hell I could ever trust it again. We went to the small diner in town called Marion's, where we both ordered the same thing. The cheeseburger and fries. I took black coffee. He drank a root beer. I let him eat before I got to the questions. It didn't take me long to devour my entire meal. Thankfully, there was no spiders. Whatever Marlboro had put in my drink had worn off completely, and the pain in my leg was back in full force, but it was hard to complain while sitting across from this guy. At least I still had all of my limbs. From what I could see, he was a below-the-knee amputee. The way he worked his crutches made it clear that he was a recent development. I decided to keep my complaints to myself. After he'd finished his burger, I tried to ease into the questions and learned as much as he would let me know. This guy was private, and all I could get out of him were the basics. His name was Jack. He was much younger than me. He worked at the gas station pretty much since high school, and he liked to mind his own business. I finally got around to asking about his injury, not expecting much of an answer, but surprisingly, he opened up like it was no big deal. I got a complex fracture a while ago. Broke my leg in two places. Not so surprisingly, this town doesn't have the best medical facilities. There was... Some, um, complications, I guess I... I got a strain of antibiotic-resistant Acinobacter, and, long story short, he imitated a chainsaw noise and gestured like he was cutting off his own leg. Then he took a sip of root beer. What do you know about this cult? I watched his face for any kind of tell, but this time, if there was any reaction, he was keeping a lid on it. Not much. Um, a dozen or so attractive millennials joined up with a charismatic personality. He recruited them all from using the internet? Probably enlightenment and orgies. That didn't end well. And I heard. Spencer Middleton part of that cult? Jack visibly shuddered at the mention of Middleton. Interesting. No, he answered. But it certainly wraps the whole story up nice and neat, doesn't it? 
You think Spencer's innocent? Jack laughed and shook his head. No, he's very much the opposite of innocent. I'm just saying that he isn't exactly a team player. Outside the window, I saw the cruiser swinging into the parking lot. Shit. Hang on, time. Look, I said finally, some weird stuff happened to me today, and I was out in these woods. Things I can't exactly explain, and I'd like nothing more than to fall asleep for a few weeks and recharge, but I can't right now. I think, I think that something's wrong with this town. I think Vanessa got caught up in it, and I think that maybe, just maybe, you know what's going on. Why would you think that? The deputy that's about to come busting in here, she seems awfully protective of you. The door opened, and O'Brien scanned the place, spotting us immediately. Jack... Still had his back to her. He said, You're not wrong. Okay, weird things happen out here. But you're looking in the wrong places. Vanessa wasn't part of the cultists. They died way before she went missing. How do you know the cultists are dead? I thought that they were only missing. That's enough questions for now, nail polish, said O'Brien as she put her hand on Jack's shoulder. You good, crutches? She asked him. Peachy. He answered. If there had been any doubt... That had taken it away. There was something going on with Jack and O'Brien. Maybe she was just protecting him. Maybe they were working together. Maybe they were hooking up. I don't know. It's damn near impossible to get a look inside his head. But the thing I took away from that interaction was this. I believed him. He knew more about the cult than he was letting on, and Vanessa wasn't part of it. So that put me close to square one. I had a meeting with Roger in seven hours, in time to burn. The sobering fact that I had killed a man that morning in self-defense was burning in the back of my mind, and I knew that when the time came, I would have to deal with that. But this was not that time. This was the time to play through the pain. There'd be a chance for a nervous breakdown later, after I found Vanessa. Or her killer. Jamie looked pretty shocked to see me. I didn't feel like explaining everything, so I just asked him to put on two pots of boiling water and find me some rubbing alcohol, floss, and a sewing kit. He's a good kid, and I hate to keep traumatizing him, but I couldn't go to the hospital just in case. Once the pots were boiling, I dropped the sewing needle into one and my car keys into the other. I knew better than most people how easy it was to bug anything these days. Even my wallet was going to stay in the console of my car until I could get back home and order new credit cards. It was going to be nothing but cash from here on out. My nephew didn't question it for a second when I told him that I was going to be driving Vanessa's Honda for the next time I was in town. I couldn't afford the very likely possibility that my car had been bugged. He didn't ask too many questions. I didn't volunteer too many answers. The farthest we got was... Why are your nails red? I have no idea. I strung some floss to the needle and bent it into a hook shape. This is going to hurt if I did it right. Hurt even worse if I did it wrong. At that moment, I wondered if it might actually be worth the spiders to keep from feeling the pain I was about to feel. I ripped off the duct tape cast, layer at a time, all the way down to the base. Then I peeled back the final layer to see the grisly X-shaped wound on my leg. Just when I think nothing can surprise me anymore. I'm proven wrong. Son of a bitch. Somehow, someone had beaten me to the punch. The wound was very neatly stitched up and was almost professionally done. The work was so clean it wouldn't leave but minimal scarring. Next to it, under a dried layer of blood, I could make out shaky handwriting where somebody had drawn on my leg with a black marker. Jerry was here. I set the needle on the table and asked Jamie if there was any old antibiotics in the house. Yeah, um, probably. Good. I'm gonna need all of them. It's amazing the difference a shower and clean clothes can make. I popped a handful of painkillers, the over-the-counter type, and took apart one of Donnie's old speakers to get to the magnet. I'm not saying I think that Marlboro stitched a tracker or a listening device inside of my leg, because that would be crazy. I'm just saying I ran a few passes of the extra-strong magnet over the stitches, just to be safe. Next, I went to Vanessa's room, and I stood for a silent moment, taking it in, trying to find a balance between respecting her privacy and tearing the place apart for clues. There was still plenty of time before my meeting, but right then I was kicking myself for all the time I'd wasted by getting shit-faced. There were still answers out there to be found. I did a quick mental recap to see where I stood. 
facts. Town has a weird secret. Someone, powerful enough to make a flip truck and three bodies disappear in the span of a few hours, was screwing with me. Someone knew how to imitate my brother, luring me into the bizarre trap in the woods, but why? The sheriff's department was only pretending to look for Vanessa's disappearance. The cult was just a cover story. Was Vanessa even involved in any of this? I was swimming through questions without any answers, when I heard Jamie say, Hey, Uncle Eric. I snapped out of my daze and turned to see Jamie standing in the doorway. Yeah, kiddo? You have a visitor. To be continued. He was waiting for me in the living room when I walked in. At first, I didn't recognize him. A short man with bad posture and thick glasses. He looked nervous when he saw me and muttered a simple, uh, Hey, detective. It took me a few seconds before I recognized him as the janitor from the school. But hey, Roger, I thought we weren't meeting until later. He shook his head and said in an exasperated voice, Oh, uh, no, I, I'm, I'm not. Uh, could you please not do that? You do what? My name is Peter Cole. I looked at Jamie and said, Do you mind giving us a minute? Jamie nodded and left towards his bedroom. I took a chair and invited Peter to do the same. After he had sat and taken a moment to calm down, I asked him a question. What's up, Peter? Why are you at my brother's kid's house? Should I be concerned? Peter took off his glasses and wiped his eyes, forcing back tears. I didn't know exactly how to react, but I assumed time would tell so I waited until he was ready to answer. After a few moments, he managed to get it together enough to say, I really shouldn't be here. If he finds out I came to talk to you, I... Who finds out? Roger. Who else? For fuck's sake. Look, Peter. Is there a reason you're here? Because I'm actually still trying to figure out what happened to my niece, and bullshit distractions like this aren't helping. I can't trust him. Who? Roger! He acts like he's working for the common good, but he really isn't. He's just a manipulator. He just cares about himself and these favors he's collecting. Uh, you know, I don't want you to expect. He hurts people. <laughs> he, he can't be stopped. I took a deep breath and I rubbed my temples. Look, Peter, I'm not interested in role-playing or whatever the hell this is. Roger is a puppet, a toy, an inanimate object. If you've got some kind of anxiety or whatever and can only communicate through the doll, that's fine. You do you, but I, I've i actually got shit to do. So unless you want to tell me whatever it was that Roger found in Vanessa's case, then please, kindly, get the fuck out of this house. Peter stood up, muttering something about being sorry for wasting my time, and left. Without defeated, another dead end. The only thing left to do is to start over. I took apart Vanessa's room piece by piece and spent a couple of hours on her laptop. There was nothing out of the ordinary to be found on either case. Her phone was still plugged in next to her bed, but it was locked with a passcode. I made a few guesses using birthdays, but nothing worked. This was too smart for that anyway. I pocketed her cell with the intention of mailing it to my guy back in New Orleans. The one who could break into anything, if the money was right, and I'd already decided to make this his priority number one. She didn't keep a diary or a day planner, or anything that could have given me an idea where to start. Her sock drawer had a stack of cash in the corner, about 350 in 10s and 20s, and a dime bag of pot. The post-it near her bed had her most recent work schedule. Everything on her laptop was password protected using a master password manager program. She was smart, but that's a level of caution that I would categorize as paranoia. I had only ever seen that kind of behavior with one other person. Me and I deal with some pretty sensitive stuff by profession. Her Facebook settings wouldn't let me see any of her posts, but Jamie was able to view her friends list from her account. I cross-referenced names with the school database, and under an hour, I had my checklist for the day planned out. It was going to be difficult running these people down without access to a phone, never mind the fact that I was a grown man trying to convince a bunch of teenagers to sit down for a Q&A.
Frankie was a tall, homely girl, and best I could tell, Vanessa's best friend. I found her at the local pizza place where she worked, and convinced her to give me a few moments of her time. She mostly corroborated what I already knew. Vanessa was saving up money, planning to move out of town, didn't have any secrets worth sharing. She wasn't seeing anybody, but... But what? Well, but she had this glow about her, like, I knew there was somebody. They went out a few times, not like a date or anything, but she, she didn't really want to talk about it. And then a couple weeks ago, it went away. Like, they broke up. But not like they were ever really official or anything, you know? Guy, girl, do you have a name? Any idea where they were from? No, see, she didn't, she didn't think it was serious enough to talk about it, I guess. They met online, I think. They caught her ex-boyfriend, Brian, as he was getting off shift from the local garage. He was in a bit of a hurry to get to the deer stand, but agreed to answer a few quick questions. I asked about the mystery person in Vanessa's life, but Brian informed me that he absolutely didn't give any fucks about what she was up to since the breakup. He was an asshole. There wasn't any impression that he was lying. I found Hammonds, her English teacher, the one that she had friended on Facebook at his home on the other side of town. He was a little too happy to cooperate, and if it wasn't for the rock-solid alibi on the night of the disappearance, taking his kids to visit their dying grandmother the next day over, I might have been tempted to play things differently. But it quickly became clear that he also had nothing to hide. He showed me the letter of recommendation that he had written for Vanessa's batch of college applications. We spent a few minutes drinking coffee and talking. He agreed that the cult story was bullshit, but he had heard some rumors around school that she was seeing somebody new. Of course, a middle-aged, overweight English teacher wasn't exactly the key holder for information when it came to students' personal lives. It wasn't a total waste, though, if he pointed me to my next lead. Morgan Hardy. According to Hammonds, everybody knew that Morgan had a thing for Vanessa. He was an awkward kid. A year under her. He still asked her out on more than one occasion and was turned down on more than one occasion. He wasn't on her list of friends, but Hammond knew where I could find him. There weren't any cars in the driveway at Morgan's house. I rang his doorbell and knocked, then waited about five minutes before circling around to the backyard and breaking in through an open window. I didn't have time to play it legal, and besides, this was hardly the worst thing that I'd done all day. It wasn't hard to figure out which bedroom was his. There was an oversized Fight Club poster, thumbtacked to his closed door like an edgy teenager beacon. I pushed it open, and immediately realized that I wasn't in Kansas anymore. There was a mirror on the wall, covered with pictures of Vanessa. Some looked like they were taken off social media. Others looked like they were snapped from a voyeur's point of view. The pictures continued all over the walls, thumbtacked in random intervals, more or less at an eye level. The room was a mess. Clothes and books and dishes stuck whatever they would fit, which made my search all the more difficult. I checked the obvious places and hit gold right off the bat. Under his mattress, next to a one-hitter and baggie of weed, was a girl's yellow t-shirt. A match for the one Vanessa wore, the last time she was seen. I could hear Morgan's car stereo blaring the god-awful excuse for music as he pulled into the driveway, giving me plenty of time to sneak out the way I came in, but that was the last thing in the world I wanted to do. Instead, I closed the bedroom door and waited for him in his closet. The door cracked just enough for me to see out. I needed to see him before he saw me. I needed to see his reaction to know for sure. It didn't take him long to get inside. He shut the bedroom door behind him and made a beeline straight for his computer desk, but then stopped halfway and muttered. What the fuck? He was taller than I expected. With at least an inch on me. Long, greasy black hair and the beginning of a patchy beard. Where he stood, he had his back to me. And by the time he turned around, I was there with my gun pointed right at him, ready for a kill shot. He fell to the ground and covered his face, screaming, Oh, please, please, uh, uh, shit, man, please don't hurt me. Shut up, I yelled at him. What do you want? Oh god, dude, just, just take whatever you want. Please don't hurt me. That was the last thing he got out before he started sobbing. Phone. Give me your phone. 
What? He blubbered. Now! Sorry! He dug his cell phone out of his pocket and held it out to me. Put it on the bed, I yelled. He nodded and tossed the phone onto his dirty, unmade mattress. I kept the gun locked onto his forehead. As I walked over to grab it. Why did you put up all these pics? Shut up! I screamed, running over to the spot where he had collapsed into a pathetic heap and smacking him across the face with my weapon. It worked. He shut right the hell up, but just to make sure, I pressed the tip of the gun against his face and put the fear of God into him. If you say one more word, just one more single word to me, I'll paint these walls red. Not if you understand. He understood. He closed his eyes and fell onto his side in the fetal position, crying. I felt awful doing this to the poor kid, but... It was the only way to convince whoever set this whole thing up that I was buying their little fabrication. He almost ruined it by asking me why I put up all these pictures of Vanessa. Yeah, I'm not the smartest person in the world, but I would be a complete moron to see an orgy of evidence like this and believe it. When I first came into town, I made a point to look up and memorize the sheriff's personal cell phone number for just such a situation as this. I picked Morgan's phone up off the bed and dialed. Clyde answered, and I'm sure he was confused as hell when I explained that I had found Vanessa's killer and told him where he could find Morgan. The look on the kid's face when he first walked into the room proved that he had no idea where all these pictures had come from. The whole thing was so nice and neat. The perfect horrible ending to the story, complete with a villain, motive, and a resolution that would sate the pain in the ass detective that was asking too many questions. He told me to stay put, and I lied and promised him I would. Five minutes later, I was in the Honda driving as fast as I could without raising any suspicion and trying to decide where the hell I was actually going. The story was starting to take shape in the worst possible way. Vanessa had to be tied to the town's secret somehow. Whatever entity had set me up this morning and made the truck disappear was now adapting their strategy, offering me a way out. All I had to do was take it. I'd actually decided that there was nothing that was going to make me stop until either I figured out what happened to Vanessa, or I was six feet under. I tried to think while I drove aimlessly around the shithole of a town, but I couldn't come up with anything actually worth calling a plan. After a few minutes on the back roads, I came up to an old mom-and-pop hardware store and remembered what Pierre had told me earlier about Vice of Vice Roger. Them. Framing me up for some open cases in town. After what I had seen, I had no idea his warning was genuine, so I decided to cover my ass and pulled into the empty parking lot to go shopping. Thirty minutes later, I had a Boy Scout basket of supplies for nearly any situation. Duct tape, pipe cleaner, rope, pliers, hammer, gloves, flashlight, BJ Weld, and some other various odds and ends. When it comes to an unknown, there's no such thing as an over-preparation. It was already getting dark by the time I left the store, and I made the mistake of feeling optimistic. And it didn't last too long. I saw the figure sitting in the passenger side front seat of Vanessa's Honda right away. There was no mistaking him. The figure, dressed all in camo, paint green smeared across his face, stared forward with a lifeless gaze. A million thoughts had tried to crash their way through my mind at once, but by some miracle I managed to grab onto the only one that mattered. Be calm, be rational, and this through. Facts. Use the facts. The man sitting in the car waiting for me looked exactly like... What was his name? Ned. He died earlier today, I checked. How long was I inside? Half an hour? How did they find me? How did they sneak his body into my car without me noticing? And why? Why? Of course I knew why. They, they couldn't take any chances. Even if Morgan took the fall for Vanessa's disappearance, I was still a loose end. Which means that this is a setup. Which means the police will be here any second. Think, think, think. Now, uh, options, go. I could run, flee the scene, call, call it in later that the car was stolen. But now it'd be covered in my DNA. We found the dead body. He would get tied back to me. What kind of story could I tell in my defense? I literally killed him, so the truth is out. No, forget that. Next option. Get in the car, gun it, anywhere. Leave the fucking town if I need to go. I can drop the body in the parking lot. No, no, the old man working the cash register in the front store would tie me to this place. Okay, okay, take the body with me. The cops will pull you over. How do you explain this? Cops aren't here yet. So that leaves me with one option. I dropped the things, raced to the trunk of the car, popped it open, and then opened the car door and checked to make sure. He was just as dead as the last time I saw him. 
The only thing different now was the bullet hole in his forehead. Whoever put him in the seat had made a point to splatter blood all over the dash and carpet, but, but I didn't have the luxury of time. This is going to need to be fast and messy. I yanked him out of the seat and dragged him over my shoulder around the back, shoved him into the trunk, and slammed it shut the same second that the deputy's cruiser pulled into the parking lot. I took a few deep breaths, tried to steady my nerves, and then, when that wasn't working, I lit a cigarette and I went back to where I dropped my bags. Evening, Mr. Riggins. I tried not to look guilty as fuck when I turned around to face the deputy rookie that I had just met yesterday. Ah, oh, Franklin, right? I said as I picked up my purchase and started for the car. He's followed right behind me. Sure is a small town, huh, deputy? Yeah, sure is, he said. I opened the back door and put my bags into the seat, keeping it casual and cool. I leaned against the car, slowly continuing to smoke the coffin nail, then offered one to Franklin, who shook his head and said, No, oh, it's all right. Been quit for a few years. Put the pack away and said, You're a better man than me. After a second, I could see that Franklin was getting nervous trying to look over my shoulder into the car. Is something wrong, Franklin? I asked point blank. No, no, we're good. His poker face was just as bad today. Well, I said, any developments with Middleton? I know you're not supposed to say anything, but off the record, does he look like he's any closer to cracking? I doubt it. I finished my smoke, put the cherry out in the heel of my boot, and then put the butt back into the cigarette pack as Franklin watched. Look, I'm flattered by the attention, but... Something tells me you're not here for my world-class conversation skills. Something on your mind? Franklin finally relaxed and let a laugh. <laughs> well, you got me. Somebody called the station and said there was a man outside in the hardware shop trying to sell drugs out of that uh, trunk of a Honda. I returned his laugh. No shit. You say what he looked like? Franklin went on to describe me to a T. Down to the black jacket scrapes on my face. Franklin and I shared another laugh. Well, I... Guess I'd better get going, I said. Before anybody gets the wrong idea, huh? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, but uh, real quick, why don't you let me take a look inside your trunk? You know, just so I can uh, put it on my report, huh? I shook my head and said, Sorry, Franklin, uh, you'll have to put in your report that I refuse to open it without a warrant. You know, it's uh, the principle of thing. Franklin nodded a couple times and said, Oh, well, well I uh, guess you better get going then, huh? I felt a deep sense of relief. It lasted all for half a second before... The radio on Franklin's belt crackled to life with the sound of a loud and urgent voice. All units, all units, be on the lookout for a Honda Accord plate number. And of Vanessa's car plate number. Be advised, the driver is Eric Riggin. He is likely armed. I tried to laugh again. But Franklin reached for his gun, so I put a right hook across his cheek hard enough to drop him and split my knuckle open. It wasn't enough to knock him out, though, but his head hit the concrete and he started groaning. I went straight for his gun, wrestled it free from his belt, and pitched it onto the roof of the store. Then, while he was still regaining his bearings, I took out his cuffs, put one around his left wrist before he snapped back into action and jumped on top of me, throwing wild punches and screaming. He was a terrible fighter and relying entirely on adrenaline. I guarded my face until he had tired himself out, then grabbed him by the wrist and gave him a solid kick to the side of his knee. He dropped again, and I put him onto his stomach, twisted his arm behind his back, Enough to connect the handcuffs. I jumped to my feet, turned to see where the sound had come from. It was the old man with white hair, the cashier from inside the hardware store. He was standing there with a shotgun in his hands, aimed at the air. No, nah, that was that was a warning shot, he said with a slight quiver in his voice. The next one's for you if you don't let go right now. As he said that, he pointed the gun at me. That's a Hatfield break-action shotgun, he said. Yeah, so what? He yeah, answered back, trying to sound so intimidating but failing. I'm not an idiot, old man. Things a single shot, and you just fired your entire payload of that warning. He trembled slightly, but refused to lower the weapon, so I gave him a little incentive, pulling my own piece and aiming it right back. This one, however, has plenty of warning shots left in it. He tossed the shotgun down and held up his hands as he made his way to his knees. Good, he said as I circled around to the front of Vanessa's car. The idiot's gunshot would have attracted every board law enforcement agent in the whole damn town. I needed to get somewhere else. Fast. To be. Continue.
I don't know what made me change my mind about going to meet with Roger. I had pretty much decided if the mentally unstable man who could only talk through a puppet was my only hope, then I was pretty much fucked anyway. But here I was, sitting outside the bowling alley, about to go inside and see what, if anything, he had to offer. I showed up early and did a few circles around the building to see if anyone else was there. No signs of any cars or activity. From the looks of it, the place had been shut down for at least a decade. I would be surprised if they even had power inside. All I could think was that this place was a nice place to get murdered. I took the pipe cleaner while I waited and used it to scrape up the inside of my gun barrel, the trick I'd picked up from some of the more seedy contacts that I had back in the city. They had found a way to tie my gun to the body currently rotting in the trunk of Vanessa's car. This would make ballistic fingerprinting impossible. Well, I thought to myself, I'm going to have to figure out how to ditch this body. And one step at a time. That was a problem for later. Right now, I had to figure out who was pulling all the strings. Nobody had shown up by 8 o'clock. At 8.05, I decided to break into the bowling alley. It's one more felony on a night like this, anyway. The back door was open when I tried it. So I slipped inside with my flashlight in one hand and my other firmly gripping my gun at the waist. The whole place smelled like a decaying carpet. The air was thick with dust, and I followed the hallway into the main lobby, where I heard the familiar voice of the puppet speaking out from somewhere in the darkness. Well, 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 Detective. You sure have been busy today, haven't you? You know, if this whole private eye thing doesn't work out, I think you have a great career in terrorism. Peter? I said, where are you? A figure emerged from the other side of the room, and once again, it was not what I was expecting. I could see the familiar wooden puppet staring right at me as it came closer and closer, but the person carrying him was not the same man that was in my family's living room earlier that day. Roger was being held, and operated by a grossly overweight young woman with tan skin and pigtails. She stared at Roger. Well, he said in the same voice he had always used, What the? Who the hell is Peter? You're expecting a friend because I distinctly remember telling you to come alone. I shined my flashlight at the girl and said, Who's this? Who are you? She covered her eyes with one hand and used the other to work the doll, saying, Don't mind her. This is Tristessa. I had to find a new host after the janitor went on his little episode. A new host? You're going to want to take this. His head spun to the side, facing the girl, Tristessa, and giving her a nod. That must have been her cue to pull a cell phone out of her pocket and offer it to me, which I accepted. I know you're smart enough to have figured out by now that your old phone is bugged to hell. Keep this on so I can reach you when I need to. It was uncanny. Her lips absolutely were not moving. The doll, I concluded, must be voiced remotely somehow and the girl was somehow moving his lips along with the words perfectly. This was insane. All right, what exactly are you, Roger? I'd love to know who I'm really dealing with. Roger let out a gleeful cackle and said, <laughs> Well, we really know who we're really talking to, don't you agree? Look, I bet you have a lot of questions, but I only have time to share the important stuff. You have to figure out the rest on your own. <laughs> If you're not comfortable with this arrangement, then you can beat your feet right now, because the only answer I'm interested in giving you are about Vanessa, as per our original deal. I shook my head and said, whatever. Look, let's just let's stick to the plan. What is it you found? It's not what I found, detective. Roger turned his head to Teresa and nodded again, signaling her to hand me a thick manila folder labeled V. Riggins. I took it and started thumbing through. Roger, or whoever was really controlling Roger, had compiled an amazingly extensive list. Her background, childhood, family, report cards, school essays, her entire life, cataloged in these pages. It was impressive work. I stopped on a page that said passwords, followed by a list. How'd you get her passwords? It's pretty easy, really. You just need to know the answers to some very basic security questions. Mother's maiden name, childhood best friend, favorite color, first pet. Uh, the, what's the point in having a secure password when password keeper is so easy to work around? I scanned the list until I found a six-digit code labeled cell. I suddenly felt the urge to change all of my passwords. 
and move off the grid permanently. All right, he said. You say it's not about what you found. Got to elaborate? He continued. In 1604, a star exploded, creating the Kelper supernova. It was reported and recorded far and wide all over the entire planet. A brand new star in the night sky. Ooh, that was a big deal. Religions claimed that it was proof of their gods. Musicians wrote songs about it. Folks lost their frickin' minds, and enough that we're still talking about it 400 years later. People spent their lives trying to find a new object up in that void. But what's funny to me is that in the last decade, dozens of stars have disappeared. That's just as remarkable a phenomenon, isn't it? The starry nights is still irrevocably changed, but nobody tells stories when something old goes away. Only when something new shows up. <laughs> now, I wonder what that says about mankind. So you're saying, the key here isn't finding something that shouldn't be there, but is. The key is finding something that should be there, but isn't. Bingo! Now you sound like a detective. All right, I said, holding up the folder. You want to tell me what should be in here? Oh, Mom. I looked at the girl, Tristessa, for any kind of emotion, but I couldn't get a read on her. I sure as hell wasn't going to look for any expressions on a puppet. Well, what about her? Well, she has almost no footprint. <laughs> She's a rock that falls into a pond and makes no ripples. Where is she? Why isn't she racing hell and trying to find her missing daughter? I put the folder under my arm and I fished out my smokes, lighting one up before answering. You seem to know a lot. Do you know what Capgrass delusion is? <laughs> As a matter of fact, I don't, but please, I live to learn. The Capgrass delusion is a mental condition where you think somebody you know, somebody you love, has been replaced. Vanessa's mother had it bad. She would tell me shit like that. I know it looks just like her. It acts and talks and smells just like her, but the thing isn't my Vanessa. Now, nothing anyone could do would convince her otherwise. Just something wrong with the way that her neurons fired. <laughs> wow, that's messed up. Yeah. He didn't say anything for a while after that, and I took the time to finish my smoke. When it was finally done, I asked, Is that it? Detective, I don't think you realize the gravity of what you just told me. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. Well, this is the key to the whole thing. This is why they chose Vanessa. They've done an amazing job of hiding her mother to the point that even I can't find her name anywhere. Wait, I said. Back up one second. What do you mean by, this is why they chose Vanessa? Well, you know that I don't. Somewhere far behind me in the dark came the sound of metal scraping. A door had been pushed open. Said Roger in a hushed tone. Can you smell that? They sent one of those big things here. How did they find us, Detective? I, I know you weren't stupid enough to be bugged, were you? I turned off my flashlight, pulled my gun, and pointed it in the direction where the noise came from. Fuck you, I whispered. How do I know that you didn't bring somebody? There was nearly pitch black in there. But I could smell it. A gag inducing something abysmal, like rotting meat, putrefied shit. It came closer to us with the sounds of heavy footsteps. I could hear it breathing loudly, like a guttural animal growl. Detective, there are three exits behind us. Our best shot is getting out of here alive is to split up and go. For once, I was already on the same page. I made a mental note of the closest way out before we had even started talking, and I was already running by the time I heard Roger's voice scream, No! The thing, whatever it was, began running. I threw Vanessa's folder and clicked on the flashlight as I bolted towards the side doors. I couldn't tell which direction the girl had gone, but the thing was right behind me, chasing me straight after and gaining. I hit the double doors full speed and they flung open, sending me falling down the three steps on the other side and landing on the broken concrete before spinning onto my back and pointing the gun up at the empty doorway. Whatever had been there was now vanished, and I didn't feel inclined to wait and see where it had gone. I got back to the car and I peeled out of there. Part of me wanting to hit the interstate and never look back, but the stronger part of me realizing how pathetic a move like that would be. It was that thing back there? Some kind of hitter? It seemed like they changed the plan again after the frame-up job went south. Now they were trying good old-fashioned murder. I knew I wouldn't last long on the road with a bolo on the car, and I 
couldn't head back to Jamie's just yet because the police would be watching. I'd run out of good options a while back, but it wasn't until I drove past the bar and saw that it was now open that I realized just how desperate I was. I helped a few bounty hunters track down dirtbags on a few occasions, and it never ceased to amaze me how stupid people can be when they're on the run. If they'd only kept their heads down, laid low, they wouldn't have been caught. If it were me, was the way I'd started plenty of thoughts back then. But if you'd told me a week ago what I was about to do, I'd have thought you were crazy. I would have never been that stupid. I pulled into the bar's parking lot, parked right there in the thing that had caught my attention from the road in the first place. The sheriff's department cruiser parked backwards in the spot. I checked the plates to make sure, and I was right. This was the same cruiser I'd been inside earlier that day. I walked inside and scanned the room, a small, poorly lit place with a ripped up pool table, broken jukebox, deer heads on every wall, and country music playing overhead, while a couple barflies sat at the stools watching something on the television in silence. The bartender was a frumpy old gal who looked like she didn't know how to smile. She was leaning against the bar with her arms crossed, wearing a blue jean jacket with the sleeves cut off, and in the far corner at a small table by herself, O'Brien was looking at something on her cell phone. I went straight to the bar and made my order. I'll take one of whatever the woman in the corner's drinking. The bartender looked over at her and gave me a disapproving face and said, Yeah, anything for you? I'll take a Jack and Coke. Hold the Jack. I'm the DD for tonight. She rolled her eyes and made up the order. One soda and one dark beer that said, You know, it ain't none of my business, but you and her don't jee-haw, hon. I know it may not be PC or whatever, but race mixing is wrong. And that's just my two cents. <laughs> but in the midst of all the crazy shit that had gone on that day, I had almost forgotten how much I hated this fucked up shitty small town, but nothing like a little fresh dose of old-fashioned racism to remind me. She put the drinks in front of me, I dropped some cash on the bar next to him and said, You're right. It ain't none of your business. I placed the beer in front of her and took a seat, waiting anxiously to find out if I'd made another mistake. O'Brien looked up from her phone and gave me an icy stare, and I returned the look with a smile. This was probably the biggest and stupidest gamble I'd ever made since showing up in this shithole, but my gut told me that she wasn't one of them, and my gut had a pretty decent batting average. So here we were. She started laughing, instantly betraying how drunk she was. Okay, so far so good. <laughs> thanks, nail polish, but I'm an adult. I can get my own roofies. I just wanted to say thanks for driving me around earlier. Yeah, <laughs> well, aren't you a gentleman? No, of course not. I, sw I swear. She laughed again, put her phone away. This was the moment of truth. Was she going to arrest me? Or She finished the half-empty beer in front of her and put the glass next to a couple of empties. Then grabbed the one I'd given her. Took a healthy swig. I took a sip from my drink and waited for her to speak. Any luck today, detective? Oh, yeah, lots. All of it bad. I suppose you expect your luck to change now, huh? Well, <laughs> I can't get much worse, can I? I looked back at the bar and caught the woman there glaring at us in disgust. Well, you can't say I didn't warn you. Thanks for the drink, but maybe you should get out of this town before somebody with an inclination to arrest you figures out that you're at the watering hole. Somebody like you, deputy? Definitely not someone like me. As you can plainly see, she gestured at the empty glass on the table, I am off the clock, and while I am off the clock, you can just call me Amelia. Now look, I know this is going to sound pretty ballsy, but mind if I ask you a few questions? She laughed out loud. It was a genuine, deep, drunken laugh, and made me realize that under other circumstances, I would probably really enjoy having a few drinks and pissing the night away with Amelia O'Brien. Sure, <laughs> why not? But I get to ask you some questions too. Well, that seems fair. So, is there a Mrs. Nail Polish? Well, there was. A couple times, actually. But there's just something about being a deadbeat husband that didn't really sit right with him. And here I assumed it was your brutal honesty that put the ladies off. Actually, that was one of the more charming attributes. She laughed again, and I relaxed just a little. So, what brings a city girl like you to a BFE town like this? 
I'm not completely sure. Sometimes I suspect that I died and this is hell. <laughs> well, that is a reasonable theory. You don't need to circle around the question with me, Riggins. I know what you want to ask. What's going on here? Well, I can't help you because I'm still trying to figure that one out myself. I showed up a month ago, and every night I go to sleep thinking the next couldn't possibly be weirder. And every day I'm proven wrong. You can call me Eric. I'm not going to call you that, Manny Petty, but if you let me bum a smoke, I'll tell you whatever I know. Not like it's going to help you anyway. I fished out two cigarettes and lit hers for her between her lips. After her first drag, she coughed and laughed and put it out. She clearly wasn't a smoker. I know this is probably hard to believe, but I didn't sleepwalk off into the forest this morning. I got a phone call from somebody claiming to be my brother. Only thing is that he'd been dead for four years. Then I heard something off in the woods. It's actually hard to explain, but when I was out there, the air started to heat up like I was, like I was boiling alive. She was listening to all this attentively, and so far I hadn't lost her. I considered finishing the story, but knew that the truth was too much for her right now, even if she bought it. No good could come from her knowing about the dead rednecks in the missing truck. You know what? I believe you. Because when I first started, there was about a week straight where the office was flooded with calls from locals saying that they were being contacted by their dead loved ones. And we, we figured it was just a bunch of kids playing pranks, but it didn't take long to figure out that no. All right, something really happened on a huge scale. Grandma Gertrude called to tell little Timmy that she didn't know where she was, but they got her, put her brain in a jar or, or some shit. It's really fucked up people out. Then one day I get the order to drop the whole thing and I'm warned not to talk about it. I put up a little, a little resistance and they saddle me with a gas station duty. <laughs> And the rest is history. She took a big swig and pulled down a half her beer before continuing. You know what a heat burst is? No, but I think I can gather from the name that it's going to be an official explanation for what happened out there in the woods. If you stick around here too long, you'll notice a pattern. No matter what happens, no matter how insane, there will always be an official explanation. Nothing supernatural ever happens. A heat burst is is a rare weather phenomenon that occurs around these parts. See, sometimes temperature will spike up, like, to 100, 120, maybe more. No good reason. You want to know why I know that? I shrug. They were talking about it on the radio last week. Last week. That's a pretty weird coincidence, don't you think? But what else could it be? You think somebody knew I'd be listening to the radio a week ago? and wanted to make sure that I'd have this story loaded up to tell you tonight just in case you were sitting here thinking, oh, I wonder what something supernatural is going on. My smoke was spent. So I put it in the ashtray and tried to think what to say. But then I felt something in my pocket vibrate. Pulled out the phone that Roger had given me and read the text message. Tris is dead. But thank God her. Going to find a new host. Stay safe. I made a mental note to pour one out for the poor girl later on. If she really was dead, then that was a damn shame. I wanted nothing more than to find the person responsible and kick his teeth in, but just like the pain in my leg and the shock of dodging death by inches more than once, I have to put this thought into a compartment somewhere deep in my mind and let it stay there until after. After what? No, I didn't even know. Look, Riggins. I'm just as hot for malicious compliance as the next girl, but I can't exactly aid in a bed of fugitive. I'm going to the little girl's room, and you're going to be gone by the time I get back, and then... Maybe after I finish this drink, I'll call Clyde, I'll tell him... I'll tell him you stopped by. I think that'll give you enough time to go back on the road and head towards that home of the best lawyer that you know. Yeah. I can do that, but... Here's the thing. There's always a thing, isn't there? No. You aren't going to like this, but... I'm gonna need a huge favor. I was right. She didn't like it. To be... Continued.
In the center of town, there's an old cemetery connected to the Baptist church. Behind it, there is a service trail leading off into the woods, which connects to a dilapidated caretaker's cottage that's been out of commission since the 50s. When I was in school, it was a popular spot for kids to sneak around and make out or get high. I had a hard time imagining teens slipping back there these days, now that the forest had swallowed up any semblance of civilization. The path was overgrown and narrow, with low tree branches reaching out like claws of forest giants, scratching the cars on both sides as I drove past. I pulled O'Brien's cruiser back there deep enough that nobody would spot it from the main road, killed the lights and engine, and I got to work. I used the passcode to glean from Vanessa's file to get inside of her phone, it started with the emails and texts. Not too much to see, but it was a long conversation chain with somebody named Toulouse. They had first started chatting a couple months ago. I had a good time yesterday. Looking forward to our next hangout sesh. Wow, desperate much? <laughs> LOL, kiss my ass. I tried to pay you a compliment. What the hell is a compliment? Is that some kind of a sandwich? God, you're so weird. Wanna come over and play Smash Brothers tonight? Can't. Got a thing. It's super mysterious, yet important as fuck. Sounds interesting. Can I have a hint? Gotta help a guy get rid of some bodies. When you're done, come play Smash Brothers. And bring beer. I'll spare you the gritty details, but there's a few times when I had to put the phone down and roll my eyes. That's how kids flirt these days. Toulouse seemed mostly harmless, but immature even by teenager standards. I honestly couldn't tell what Vanessa saw in him, or her. But there's no accounting for taste, and Toulouse made her type LOL enough times that she must have enjoyed his company. There's nothing overtly sexual in their messages. Just a strange overtone of two horny kids trying to figure themselves out. I felt like such a creep, and reminded myself that this is what I did for a living. Stalking couples, waiting for cheaters to get busy, then stealing some photos while they were going at it. The only difference here is that I knew the person whose life I was digging into. Even still, I couldn't shake the nagging feeling that this feels wrong. Vanessa and Toulouse's texts weren't as exceptional as I'd hoped. A whole lot of see you tomorrows gave me the impression that Toulouse was from work. The couple I had fun last night told me that they had gone out for some non-dates. A ton of emojis back and forth reminded me of just how out of touch I was with this generation. And then the whole thing ended abruptly. A few messages from Vanessa. Hey, what are you doing? You there? You bored? Wanna hang out? Hello? I guess you're not talking to me anymore, huh? Lose my number. What the hell did I do? Vanessa was a friend of mine. Douchebag. I should have listened to everybody when they said that there's something wrong with your brain. You're an asshole. Sorry, my bad. Autocorrect. What I meant to say was, Vanessa was a friend of mine. You twat waffle McFuckface. And that's how it ended. The date of the last message put the conversation about a week before her disappearance. I saved Toulouse's number on the burner I got from Roger and made a plan to track the line down once I had a moment's reprieve. The next step was checking her phone for pictures. I opened the gallery, scrolled down a ways, and started flicking through the slideshow in chronological order. Vanessa was a normal teenage girl. She took what I would consider an average amount of selfies. One for every day or so. I studied them looking for any sort of clue or indicator that something was wrong, or about to go wrong. But she was always happy, always wearing the same old brown jacket and that same typical teenage girl smile. I had to smile when I first saw it, the jacket. I recognized it as the one Donnie used to wear all the time. It was a little too big on her, but she made it work. Starting about a month back, there were more frequent pictures of her, four, five, and Maybe more each day. Not selfies, though. Somebody else was taking pictures of her with her phone. Well, she looked back and laughed. The last picture on her phone was taken an entire week and a half before she went missing. Two days before her breakup text with Toulouse. And that last picture was the only one I needed to see. Motherfucker. The last photo showed her and Toulouse cheek to cheek, smiling in a shared selfie, and I recognized the guy that she was with instantly. I had met him the day before. He said he didn't really know her all that well, only back then I knew him as Jerry. 
and I was quickly running out of reasons not to beat the shit out of this guy. I lit a smoke to calm my nerves and then remembered that I wasn't in my own car, and O'Brien might not be too merciful when she got her car back smelling like tobacco. I rolled down my window, that's when I smelled it. That sour, putrid stench, the one from the bowling alley. I flicked on the headlights, illuminating the forest path in front of me, but as far as I could see, it was empty. Then I heard it. Stomping through the overgrown trail far behind me, walking towards the cruiser from the cemetery, and instantly realized why O'Brien always parked her car facing the road. I couldn't see what it was, but I could smell it from a mile away. The thing, whatever it was, kept walking closer and closer, the outline of its shape slowly taking form in the darkness, an unnatural juggernaut, enormous, wide, dark, and dragging something behind it that scraped at the road with each step. From this distance, there was no way for me to make out exactly what I was dealing with. It was protected by shadows and whatever manner of monster, one thing was glaringly obvious. I didn't want to be out here alone with it. I turned on the engine, then reached for the gear shift and heard the sound of that thing's feet slamming onto the ground as it sprinted down the path towards me with impossible speed. By the time I had the car in gear, it was there. The car rocked as the back window was shattered into pieces, the roof bulged, and suddenly the front window erupted into a spiderweb of broken safety glass. I dropped my lit cigarette onto my lap and tried to figure out what the hell was going on. In the center of the smashed glass, a giant piece of metal wriggled and pulled itself free and then disappeared into the sky It came right back down into the windshield again with a loud impact that completely covered the entire field of vision and broken glass. The reality of the situation clicked into place, and I screamed, OH SHIT! The thing was standing on the roof of the car, swinging a giant mallet into the windshield, and by the looks of it, it didn't have long until there was nothing left between me and the hammerhead. DRIVE! I couldn't see anything in front of me, and even if I could, I didn't have anywhere to go. The trail would dead end in the forest, and I would be fucked. The reverse didn't feel like a much better option. The back window was busted out, but there was no light to guide me. And I'd pretty much be flying blind. There wasn't enough room to turn around, and I sure as hell wasn't going to leave the rapidly deteriorating safety of the vehicle. The piece of metal that had penetrated the laminated glass in front of my face started to bulge like the thing was getting ready to pull it back out for another swing, and I made a split-second decision to kick the car into reverse and put the pedal to the floor. We lurched backwards and started flying down the trail, but somehow the thing on the roof didn't fall off. An enormous hand the size of a baseball glove reached down and wrapped its fingers through my open window. Giant, gray, inhuman digits gripped the roof just inches from my face, and I could see another hand on the opposite side as it smashed through the tempered glass of the passenger side window. This titanic fuck was laying flat on top of the car with an arm span wide enough to reach both side windows at the same time. I kept my foot pressed hard onto the gas while I yanked at my Beretta, pressed it against the roof, and fired off three shots. I would have fired off a fourth, but the car bounced over a tombstone, and we went into a quick spin. I yanked the wheel back, gaining control without even dropping speed. I'd cleared the forest road and hit the cemetery, and we were going over graves, colliding with markers, mowing over the smaller ones, and ricocheting with the bigger ones. At one point, I ran over the back bumper. Before I knew it, we were through the ditch and back on the main road. There were street lights here, and I could actually see the path in front of me. I swung the wheel again, fishtailing into a near-perfect 90-degree turn that pointed me in a straight line down the road. We climbed in speed, and in no time I was redlining the RPMs, but this thing held on firmly to the top of the car. The road was about to run out, a sharp dead man's curve to the left, and despite my performance up to this point, I wasn't so sure I'd be able to hook another turn at these speeds in reverse gear. If I stayed the course, I was going to crash into another dense portion of forest, so I made one more split-second decision. I picked up my gun, put it against the roof again, and started shooting at the same moment I slammed the brakes, sending us into a long skid, tires screeching against the road loud enough to wake the dead. The thing finally flew off the top of the car and landed somewhere between the trees across the ditch with a loud crash. I immediately pointed the gun back there and waited to see if it was going to get up. The only sounds were those of the unhealthy rattle of the cruiser engine and my own heartbeat pounding in my ears. I still hadn't gotten a good look at it, and now I couldn't even tell where the thing was. What are you doing? Get out of here! I turned in my seat to face forward and realized that I still couldn't see out of the front window. The shattered laminated glass held it in place, and it was impossible to look through. I pointed my gun at it, and I caught myself. What are you doing? This I won't work. This isn't a fucking movie. Okay, so what are my options? I had to get that windshield out or this car was useless. 
I put the cruiser in park, opened my door, took a breath, and stepped out into the open road, bracing myself for another attack. And the thing wasn't too far away. I knew that much from the horrendous smell that continued its assault on my senses. My gun wasn't about to leave my hand until I was at least ten miles down the road. When a few seconds had passed, I finally turned half my attention away from the forest and looked at the deputy's cruiser. The vehicle looked like I felt. It beat to hell and back and running on fumes and prayers. The sides were scraped up and covered in dirt and the frame was dented in to the point that any reasonable insurer would call it a total loss twice over. Somehow the engine was still running and the car could still go and right now that was all I needed from it. If I managed to survive all this, O'Brien was going to kill me. The mammoth mallet still sticking out of the windshield was a metal grip sledgehammer. I climbed onto the hood of the car and grabbed the thick handle with my free hand and pulled until it started to come free of the glass. This wasn't going to be easy. The tool was a custom job, a steel pole thick enough that I could barely grip it with one hand, welded to the block of square metal. A weapon for someone or something way stronger than me. Before too long, I realized that this heavy bastard was a two-handed job and begrudgingly holstered my gun for just a moment while I pulled with all of my strength to yank that hammer out of the glass and drag it off the car onto the road. Without a doubt, the weapon weighed more than I did. On the bright side, the hole that the sledgehammer left in the windshield was big enough that I could see through it, and I didn't waste any more time before putting some distance between myself and that thing in the woods. I left the cruiser parked behind the daycare center a few blocks from Vanessa and Jamie's house, then made my way through the backyards, praying that there wouldn't be any unchained pit bulls along the way. For once, luck was on my side, and I got to my brother's backyard without any hitches. I was annoyed to find the back door was unlocked. It was clear that Jamie was way too trusting to live in this town on his own, and this just reinforced that I made the right call in what I was about to do. Hey, kiddo! I yelled in the kitchen suddenly realizing for the first time that I had fucked up my ears. I snapped my right finger next to my head to confirm. I was definitely deaf in that ear. He came out of his bedroom and took one long look at me before saying, You look like you've been in a fight. I turned my head slightly to point my good ear at him and responded, Yeah, well, you should see the other guy. It's weird that I could make it this far without realizing that I had fucked up my ears. Adrenaline really is a wonder drug. We need to get you out of town, he said. Right now. What? Why? We don't have time to discuss it. I'll explain in the car. Get packed. Only what you need and can't live without for the next 48 hours, understand? Leave your phone, leave any electronics. You get 30 seconds to pack, and I'll go move. Uncle Eric, I don't think I can- 28 seconds! Did I stutter? He ran back into his room, and I pulled out Roger's burner and called O'Brien. She picked up after the first ring and said, Yeah. Okay. I need a favor as soon as you can. Don't say I never did anything for you. She hung up and I crossed into the living room, over to the blinds and peeked out. The deputies sitting outside in unmarked sedans couldn't have been more obvious if they tried. They could see Williams reclining in his front seat and playing a game on his cell. If this was all I was up against, it would be an embarrassment if I got caught. But the real threat was still out there, and I'd have to give these guys the slip first. I watched as Williams got the call over his radio, sat up and answered before he pulled out his spot and drove away, followed shortly by the other two cars. O'Brien would have just called in the report. Shots fired at the high school. Eric Riggins had lost his mind and started trading lead. She was pinned down and needed backup. This distraction would give us just enough time to get out of there. I yelled towards Jamie's room, Ten seconds, kid! Don't forget your jacket! And that was the moment. The moment it all slipped into place for me. They say your subconscious keeps working on problems when they're in the back of your mind, even when you don't realize what you're actually looking for. It's not what's there, but what shouldn't be. I read the report on Vanessa more times than I could recall. That night she disappeared was a cool one. Damn near every picture of her on that phone had one thing in common. She was wearing Donnie's old brown jacket. Jamie came out of his room with his backpack slung over his shoulder and said, Okay, I'm ready. The night your sister went missing, you said she was wearing a yellow t-shirt. The question caught him by surprise. Yeah, so? Was she wearing her jacket? He shook his head. No, I, I don't think so. You don't think so? Or are you sure? 
I'm, I'm sure. I'm, I'm pretty positive. She wasn't wearing Dad's jacket. The lip quivered, and I got the sense that maybe he was hiding something. Jamie looked at me. Is there something from that night you aren't telling me? No. He was lying. It was written all over his face. He stared at the floor and said, Can you just go now? I walked past him to Vanessa's room. We were spending precious seconds here, but this was important. I knew I was onto something, just not sure what it meant yet. It's what should be there. What isn't? I had already gone through every single thing in his room, but I needed to see if maybe I had somehow missed it. Donnie's old jacket had struck a nerve when I saw it in the picture. I realized it the moment I saw her wearing it. I would have that same reaction if I'd seen it in here earlier, but I hadn't. Jamie came into the room while I was digging through the clothes hung up in her closet. What is it? He asked. Does your sister have any laundry anywhere? No. She did a load the day before she went missing. What about her jacket? Have you seen it anywhere? Do you know where it ended up? No. Maybe she left it in her car. I knew for a fact it wasn't in the car. And it wasn't here in her room. And she wasn't wearing it when she disappeared. That thing was clearly more than just a piece of clothing to her. It looked stupid, but she wore it to work every day anyway. So, so it had to have some sentimental value to her. So where the hell was it? Jamie, this is important. Are you sure you don't know where the jacket is? I swear, I, I have no idea. Why? Don't worry about it. We need to go. Now. We took the back roads headed away from the school. Jamie was kind enough to not make a big deal out of how junky my car had gotten, ignoring the fast food containers and empty liquor bottles on the floor. I kept one eye on the rearview mirror and waited until we were a few miles from his place before I started digging into the suspicious look that he had given me earlier when I asked if there was more to the story. Jamie, I need to ask you some more questions. Okay, fine. That night Vanessa went missing. I know it's hard, but I need you to go back there again and walk me through the whole thing. What was the first thing you remember that day? I don't know. Okay, we'll start with that night. You were watching television. She came out of her room, didn't say a word, walked right out that door. Is that correct? Yeah, that's what happened. All right. What were you watching? I... Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I don't remember. But you do remember exactly what she was wearing. Yeah, that's a little weird. Your memory sure was being selective that night, huh? I hated this, but it had to be done. They can't treat him like family. He's a witness, and he's hiding something. So, not up and grill him. Look, I told you everything that was important. That was important? What aren't you telling me, kid? He was silent. So I slammed on the brakes and yelled, Hey, tell me what you're keeping secret. I just spent the last two days getting the shit kicked out of me by every fucking weird thing in this town, and the last thing I need is for my own blood to start lying to me, too. I'm not lying! He shouted back with tears in his eyes. It just wasn't important, okay? Bullshit. I'll decide what's important. You just tell me the truth. The tears were running down his face as he said, You had a fight, okay? About what? I, I don't even know. Just some stupid stuff. I thought she had been acting weird, like there was something wrong with her. And then, and then, and then the last thing I said to her, he lost it at that point. Sobbing into his hands, loud and ugly, real. Broke my heart, but I knew we were getting somewhere. Look, I loved your dad, okay? I know he loved me too. He was my only sibling. We used to we used to get into fights all the time. Not just play fights. Something something about growing up together gives you the ammo to really hit someone where it hurts. We could tear each other apart. But at the end of the day, I knew we were family. Nothing could change that. Your sister loved you, and an entire lifetime of being your big sis isn't going to get wiped away over one stupid fight. You don't understand, I sobbed. Last thing I said to her was that, was that mom was right. What did you mean by that? I told her I didn't really believe she was my sister. And then she left. And that's the last time that anyone saw her. I think, I think I made her. No, shut up. You didn't, don't you dare say that. You don't even think that. Your sister was smarter than me. She didn't do anything. You didn't make her do anything. Somebody took her, and when I find out who, I'm going to make them pay. Do you think she's still alive? I didn't answer. I just started driving again and watched the road. The 
What in the ever-loving fuck is this? O'Brien yelled while I stood in her doorway with Jamie at my side. Look, we didn't have anywhere else to go. Literally, anywhere else in the fucking world, Eric. Not my house. Hey, she called me Eric. I let her scream and yell and make a big deal about it, and once she was done, I pointed out the fact that this wasn't for me. It's for my 15-year-old nephew. And at that point, she couldn't really say no. She had sobered up a lot in the past couple of hours since the bar where I had convinced her to call in the bogus shooting at the school. After that, I gave her a ride home in Vanessa's car. Then I stole her keys and went back to the bar and stole her cruiser, but she didn't know about that part and I was fine with letting her figure it out on her own later. After I was dead, or out of town. Once Jamie was safe inside O'Brien's house, I turned to leave. Aren't you coming inside too? I got someone I need to talk to first. That's too bad, she said. Do me a favor. Try not to die. My next stop was at the shitty gas station at the edge of town. I pulled into the parking lot to find Toulouse with a water hose and smoking a cigarette and spraying down the concrete. I parked, got out, went up to him, and then snatched him by the neck and put him against the wall. He calmly took the cigarette out of his mouth, smiled at me, and said, Hey, detective. What's up? I held Vanessa's phone next to his face. The picture on the screen was the selfie he had taken with her, the last picture to be taken before she disappeared. You want to tell me something? Yeah. Not particularly, but if it'll keep you from kicking my ass, I'll tell you whatever you want. You will. I lied. Okay, here's the thing. Van and I were close, but you're like her dad pretty much, and... <laughs> I don't do well with parents. Look, you got three seconds to stop with the bullshit before I make you eat this phone. Okay, fine. You got me. I lied to you because I didn't want you really looking for her or if if you were one of them. Cut out with the vague pronouns. Who were them? I have no idea. The ones that took Van. I put the phone in my pocket, pulled out my Beretta, and put it to his head just in case there was any confusion about whether or not I meant business. But Jerry just chuckled and said sarcastically, Oh no, not a gun against my head. Look, detective, believe it or not, this ain't my first rodeo. <laughs> Just tell me what you know. Well, uh, you wouldn't have believed it yesterday, but maybe now you're ready. The truth is that somebody took Van, but it wasn't two weeks ago. It was more like a month ago. <laughs> I figured it out right away. The thing that came into work the next day, well, that wasn't her. Sure, it, it looked like her. Acting like her, but I wasn't going to be fooled. No. Now, now I know you're not going to believe this, but I have a little experience with clones. And she, oh, she wasn't a very good one. I tried to figure out what, what I thought of this, because honestly, I couldn't decide. Luis took my hesitation as an opportunity to put his cigarette back into his mouth and take a drag. I let go of his neck, then put my piece away and asked, Why would somebody want to clone Vanessa? Well, isn't it obvious? She was the test run! If she could infiltrate Vanessa's life without raising suspicion, then, well, they would know that their recipe works. But it didn't. So, she had to go before anyone with credibility realized what had happened. That was a couple weeks ago. It's entirely possible that they're still switching people out. Maybe they fixed the kinks in Vanessa. And now, now, they don't even know who's real and who's been replaced. What's the point in switching people out with clones? Well, duh. It's an invasion, man. He finished his smoke and flicked it off into the grass. And then I asked, the night Vanessa went missing, the real night she went missing, assuming this is true, did you see her? Yeah, yeah, we were together. You remember what she was wearing? What? Can you tell me what she was wearing? The night she actually disappeared. Jerry thought for a second, and then said, Hold on a sec. We're dragging out his cell phone, flicking through a few photos and holding it out to me, showing me a video he recorded of Vanessa and him taking turns tossing two liter bottles of soda to each other while the other tried to cut them in half with a sword. Now in that video, she wore jeans, a green long sleeve, and Donnie's brown jacket. When it was finished, Luce smiled proudly to himself and put the phone back in his pocket. That was the last night before, as you say, she was taken and replaced. Yeah. 
I had just gotten the rad sword and come up here to try it out. And we, we ended up breaking it like two days later, but it was totally worth it. This was textbook crazy, but what he said made some kind of sense. There was no denying the fact, after that night in Toulouse's video, Vanessa started acting differently. Her best friend confirmed it, her brother confirmed it, even her phone confirmed it. She'd stopped taking selfies. For two weeks, it was like she was a different person, and then, the final straw, her own brother told her that he knew she wasn't the real Vanessa, and then, what? She gets out of there before anyone else has a chance to suspect? Whoa, dude, what's that smell? That's to lose. I snapped out of it and realized what he was referring to and pulled my gun. That thing, the juggernaut, it was here. And from the smell, I knew it was somewhere close by. Get inside and lock the doors, I said. Okie dokie, he answered, before bounding into the gas station building. I pointed the gun, scanning the edge of the parking lot where the light meets the darkness. And then I heard it. Walking through the forest on the opposite side, I kept the gun aimed in the direction of the noise. A strange, inhuman, gurgling breath and the loud dragging of something heavy through the brush. I walked towards the noise. This is going to be a showdown. And if this thing killed me, I didn't want it taking out Toulouse just because he was there. Then it stepped out of the forest. And for the first time, I saw it. And my blood ran cold. To be concluded. thing. The juggernaut almost looked human, in the same way a child's crayon drawing might almost look like a horse. The pieces were there, but the proportions were way off. It towered an easy seven feet, even with the clear curvature of the spine that gave it a sideways hunch. The body was inhumanly wide, like an upright grizzly. The hands, a dark shade of ashy gray, were hairy and composed of fingers like sausages and nails blackened from blood ruptures. As it dragged the sledgehammer behind the pavement, it moved with an arithmetic gait as if it were still learning to walk on two legs of different sizes. Like a chimera from the ancient stories, this creature stalking ever closer was made up of mismatched parts. The head didn't come close to anything remotely human, but its visage is burned into the corner of my memory in a place where no amount of therapy will ever allow me to forget. The face, if you can call it that, was coated in black scales and comprised of an elongated snout that formed the top half of a jaw. The bottom was equally long, connected at a hinge like that of an alligator, with ivory hooks growing wildly in every direction from the maw. If the monster had any eyes, I couldn't see them. The lipless orifice hung open, exposing a wet tongue, tangled in jagged rows. The teeth were overgrown like a cancer and there was no way the mouth could ever close without shredding the gums to pieces. I didn't know how it ate. I wasn't even keen on finding out. The noise came from within a wheezing gurgle, steady with each shallow breath. For the life of me, I couldn't figure out why, but somebody had gone through a lot of effort to dress him. On the outside, an extra-long black duster. Beneath the body was more or less contained within a long-sleeved blue jumpsuit and on its feet were a new pair of enormous black tactical boots. There was a sort of fog about the creature, and as it came closer, I realized that the humming cloud around its face was actually a thick swarm of flies. Festering boils on its neck wriggled with maggots, and I became dizzy just trying to fathom what I was beholding. This must have been what they thought of when they first invented the word abomination. I kept my Beretta steady waiting for the thing to charge. With the way it ran back at the bowling alley and in the cemetery, I likely wouldn't have but a split second, if that, to take it down. The gun was pointed at the widest point on its center, the chest, where I quickly noticed a cluster of bullet holes already in the jumpsuit and stained black. Looks like I hit him already. Whatever this thing was, my pathetic 9mm wasn't going to do more than annoy it. But at this point, running simply wasn't in the cards. Yet again, I found myself with the ever-familiar feeling of being a sitting duck. Think fast. You're running out of time. Options? Run? Hide? Not too late for that. Shoot it! 
The thing took four shots to the chest before you launched him off the car. He's not going down from bullets. Unless... Headshot? It could work. Go for the weapon. Shoot his hands. Also valid options, but even without that hammer, a charge from that thing would be like getting run over by a truck. I need to slow him down. Slow him down. That's the play. I can keep a hammer's distance, but if this thing starts moving like he did earlier... I pointed the gun at his knee and fired six shots in rapid succession. The cloud of flies exploded off the monster after the first impact, and the creature stopped. But it didn't go down. It stood still with that expressionless reptilian face. I waited. After a tiny eternity, the thing shifted its weight to its good leg and lifted the wounded one, moving it clumsily forward. And then landed. I held my breath and I watched as it trod the injured limb, then dragged the metallic weapon forward and moved its other leg. It had just taken another step. And all those shots had succeeded in doing were jack and shit. The cloud of flies had returned to the area around the monster and I prepared myself to go out swinging. When he charges, starts shooting. If there's a reason God decided not to let me die right then and there, I don't know what it could have been. I'm not a good person. I've barely done anything in my time on this earth to make anybody miss me when I'm gone, but... Whatever the reason, this was not going to be the moment I had to face my maker. The partial deafness from the gunshot, coupled with the situational blinders, kept me from noticing the black vans until they had sped past me and screeched to a stop. I didn't see where the smoke grenades had come from, but the parking lot was swallowed in a thick gray in a matter of seconds. The last thing my eyes were able to pick up was the juggernaut lifting the weapon over its head. When the shot started, I hit the ground. By my count, I was dealing with at least half a dozen fully automatic weapons. I held my breath and I started to crawl away from the fray. The next thing I remember was waking up on the floor of a moving vehicle. There was splitting pain in my side, reminding me of all the shit I put my body through that day. I was on my back when I came to, and I sat straight up. The van rocked back and forth as we drove. There were no windows back here, only bench seats against the walls, and five heavily armed men in camo fatigue and tactical gear. In front of me was a sixth man, only he didn't have a weapon or a helmet, or any kind of gear. He was just dressed in a tan t-shirt and jeans. And when he saw I was awake, he smiled and said, He's up. Good. Welcome back. Where am I? I instinctively reached for the spot on my side and found nothing but an empty holster. One of the armed men put a firm hand on my shoulder, his way of saying, take it easy, and no sudden moves. Don't worry, you're safe now, said the man in jeans. That's not what I asked, I sat back. Who are you people? We've been watching you for a while, detective. You're lucky that we showed up when we did. This is it. I'm finally getting to see the man behind the curtain. Where's Vanessa? I demanded. Wow, the guy shot back. You really have no idea what's going on, do you? I know enough. I know you're part of some shady organization with reach and pull. I know you're working on something big, and you're willing to kill people to keep a lid on it. And I know my niece was involved somehow. I was showing my hand, but at this point, I didn't even care. They had me dead to rights. And even if I played dumb, there was no way they were going to let me off without a warning. I also know you're responsible for what's been going on in this town. The disappearances, the phone calls from the dead, the weather. I don't know how. But I know you- Let me stop you right there, he interrupted. You're embarrassing yourself, because not one part of that was correct. Yeah, there's something going on here, but we're not it. We didn't take Vanessa. We've been trying for years to find out who or what is actually responsible for all of this. Bullshit. You're saying that this shithole small town just happened to have two secret paramilitary organizations? <laughs> no, 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 no. Definitely more than two. The van made a sharp right turn and I started tracking seconds. I couldn't be sure how long I was out, or even how they knocked me out to begin with. But if, if I made it out of this van alive, I might be able to retrace my steps. Let me ask you something, Detective. How much time have you spent at the gas station? I mean, concurrently. Because it looks like you actually slept there. That place messes with your head, you know. 
Most people can't stand it for more than a couple of hours at a time. I ignored his question and asked my own. So, if you're not the one that took Vanessa and framed me, then who the hell are you? <laughs> well, you can consider us an, an interested third party. Yeah, I replied, echoing Spencer's words from yesterday. There sure seem to be a lot of those in town. A man pulled a gun from beneath his seat and pointed it. Before I could move, the men on either side of me clamped down their grips on my shoulders, holding me in place. I looked at the gun and recognized it as my own Beretta. You are me? The man asked. I knew this guy. He was a ranger in the army. You remind me of him. No, I'm not army. The man nodded, then stared at the ground like he was trying to decide what to say next. The van made another right turn, and I, I restarted my count. You know what's weird? You'd be so careful, constantly watching your rear view, switching up cars, keeping ear to the ground, and still, you couldn't find the tracking device they put in your gun. No, don't worry, we took it out. They have no idea where we are now. They? The ones that actually took your knees. I wasn't buying this story for a second. After everything, they had tried to throw me off the trail. This was just another elaborate setup. But why? Why not just let that thing kill me and be done with it? Were they testing me to see what I knew? How much I had figured out? For what it's worth, we've been trying to find her. But these guys are careful. They cover their tracks, avoid every camera, leave no footprints. Then you come along and they get sloppy, they get frustrated, and they send a knight after a pawn. <laughs> no offense. Oh, fuck you. He continued. We've finally captured one of their tall guys. And all we had to do was piggyback off their tracking device and follow you until it decided to show. Oh, this is a big deal for us. The van turned to the right. They're driving in circles. At this point, I knew that there were two possibilities. Either this guy was telling the truth or he was lying. I couldn't decide which was worse. But regardless, one thing was clear. I needed to get out of this van if I wanted to live. Once they were done questioning me, I was just a loose end. Okay, I said trying to buy time. You're the good guys. You want to take out that secret organization? You must know more about them than me, right? Oh, <laughs> you know about Planet X. Scientists have known for years that there's another planet out there because they can see the effects. Jesus, is every person in this town talking sermons? They don't know what it looks like or even where it is, but they know it's there. This organization we've been tracking is huge, but all we get to see are the gravitational effects. Gravitational effects? Is that what you call an 18-year-old girl vanishing without a trace? He kept the gun pointed at me and reached his free hand into his pocket to pull out a cell phone. As he typed on it, in one hand he spoke. They sent out one of the tall guys to grab her after she left the gas station. We tried to catch up to them. We really did. And to be frank, we thought that she was dead. Until the next day when she showed up for work like nothing had ever happened. Took us a while to realize the girl that came back wasn't really Vanessa Riggins. So you took her, right? Kidnapped the double agent for questioning? That's where the story is headed, isn't it? He pressed a button on his phone and held it out to me while a video played. I instantly recognized the aerial view of Vanessa and Jamie's neighborhood at night. The source must have been a drone. It was steady and clear. This is the night she officially went missing. The camera was wide, but I could see the house in focus. I watched as the front door opened and Vanessa walked calmly to the edge of the driveway in jeans and a yellow t-shirt. She looked down at the road at something out of frame. And I saw it. The sheriff's cruiser pulled to a stop and she got in the passenger seat and then... And then they drove away. What in the ever-loving fuck is going on in this town? Are you familiar with the theory of pocket realities? The steady pop, 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 pop from somewhere else in the distance arrested all of our attention. I instantly recognized it as automatic weapon fire, but maybe a mile or so out. I could see the moment the same realization registered in the man's face. He jumped out of his seat and grabbed the radio from somewhere in front of the van and yelled into it. Victor, come in. 
We hear gunfire. Is the package secure? There was no response on the other end of the radio, but the gunfire continued, and then... And then it didn't. We all held our breaths, and we waited until the man yelled at the driver, Turn around! We need to help them! I wasn't going to get a better distraction than this. I jumped out of my seat, wrapped my arm around the man's neck, and spun him around and towards the other man as a human shield. Before he knew it, I had my Beretta again, and it was pressed against his head. You're making a mistake. We weren't going to hurt you. I'll take my chances. I grabbed the handle of the van door, yanked it open, and dove out into the wet grass. I tried my best to tuck and roll, but I... I still ripped open my stitches and bruised both elbows before sliding down the hill towards the forest. I could hear the van screeching to a stop while I pulled myself up and ran into the thick covered trees. Spent hours out there in the dark, doing my damnedest to keep moving, no matter what. I couldn't know if they were following me or not, but I wasn't going to take any chances. Eventually I hit a creek bed and followed it upstream until I reached an old bridge, then I collapsed under it and slept until morning. After those few precious hours of rest, I started following the road back towards town. I put my thumb out to the first passerby, hoping that I might get lucky. And amazingly, it pulled over. The car was a new model shiny red Firebird, and the, the driver was an old woman that I knew from my childhood. Aggie Sistrunk. She didn't recognize me. She was already old when I was a kid, and at this point, I wonder if she even knew what day it is. Old Aggie offered me a swig of her medicine while she drove me back into town. I politely declined. Then she asked me where I was headed, and I gave her the address. Clyde didn't get home till around noon. She gave me plenty of time to raid his pantry, clean up my wounds, and of course, search his house for clues. I came up empty in the last category, but I had already assumed that that was going to happen. If he was one of them, he wouldn't be sloppy enough to leave evidence in his underwear drawer. Not that it was really much of an if anymore. I saw him in that video. He was the one driving the car that picked up Vanessa on the night she went missing. I should have seen him earlier. Of course, the sheriff would have to know what's going on. An operation this size couldn't fly under law enforcement radar forever. Now, I wasn't expecting him to come home until much later, but I was ready just in case. I surprised him in his kitchen. Let the bread do most of the talking. Hey there, Sheriff. Fancy meeting you here. He went pale. But he didn't reach for his gun. Or put up a fight. I was hoping he wouldn't. But prepared just in case. Fortunately, things were working out. I took his gun and I walked him into the den. There were no windows in here, no weapons. And the seats were arranged far enough apart that I could sit across from him. Without having to worry about him making a move. Once his ass was down on the couch, I poured him a glass of his most expensive scotch and set it down on the coffee table in front of him. Professional courtesy. I took my seat across the room and broke the silence. I have to assume you know why I'm here. Because you're a lunatic. Maybe. Try harder. We found the body in the trunk of Vanessa's car. I don't know why you're doing this. Pull my other leg. He plays jingle bells. What followed was another heavy silence. I could see he wanted to say something, but couldn't bring himself to do it. And that was fine by me. As long as I was on this side of the gun, I didn't mind waiting. Finally, he broke down and grabbed the drink, put the whole glass back in one go, and then he said, Well, how much do you know? That's not going to work, Clyde. You tell me what you know. I had nothing to do with Vanessa's abduction. Bullshit. You picked her up the night she disappeared. What? No, I'm not talking about her, I'm talking about Vanessa. The girl I picked up that night wasn't even... He caught himself. He took a long, sad breath before continuing. I had very specific instructions for what I was supposed to do if this ever happened. Instructions? From who? Tell me who you work for, and this will all be over soon. Gave me a chilling look. One that I'll never forget. He said, Thanks for the drink, detective. I should have been smarter. I'll never forgive myself for being so careless. For not giving him a thorough pat down. In the midst of all my planning, it had never occurred to me that he might have a second piece. The gun in his ankle holster was a PS1 single shot, a pocket shotgun. Before I could scream no, he put the gun in his mouth and ate the bullet. 
painted the walls of the living room. Jesus fucking Christ. My brain kicked into overdrive. Why would he do that? What do I do now? What's the play? I have no answers. But an overwhelming urge to get away from here as soon as possible, the cell phone in my pocket began to ring. Roger was calling. Do I answer? Does he know what happened? Can he help? I let it ring. I weighed my options. What options? There's no options. You leave this house, make sure there's no DNA, no prints, get the fuck out of Dodge, or you'll go down as a cop killer. Yeah, my, my choices are looking pretty limited. I answered the phone. Finally! I've been starting to think that they got to you. Roger, listen to me. I'm in deep shit. Is this line secure? Detective, this might be the only line in the whole town that isn't being monitored, but I can guarantee you that this is just the two of us. Look, I need to tell you two things, okay? The sheriff is dead. I didn't kill him. There was a lull in the conversation. So long that I had to wonder if I'd been disconnected. And then Roger came back in line with it. Oh. Oh, this is bad. This is real bad. Should I... Should I assume that you're with the late sheriff right now? You can assume. You need to get out of there yesterday, because the chatter on the radio is all about the shots fired at the sheriff's house. And that call came in ten minutes ago. Fuck! I made a break for the front door, but stopped at the window when I saw the flashing lights outside. I turned and ran to the back door, pushing it open, and took off towards the fence. But before I could make it two steps, I was surrounded. Every deputy was working that day. Actually, all but one. And there were more guns pointed at me than I could count. I dropped to my knees. I threw up my hands and I closed my eyes, embracing for the inevitable. They tackled me hard. Someone pushed his knees against my neck while they twisted my arms behind my back and put on the metal bracelets. A team of them dragged me out front and tossed me into the back of a squad car. And they left me there to cook for an hour. The whole time. The only thing I could think was why am I still alive? When they finally sorted out the crime scene, I was taken to the sheriff's station. I did my best to cooperate, but that didn't stop them from slamming me into a few walls or taking turns sucker punching me in the back and kidneys. To them, I was a monster. I was lower than garbage, and they were taking me to be with the only other person as bad as me. The holding room was small, dark, windowless, only big enough for two cells, and those cells were just simple metal cages. They throw me into the other one closer to the door and lock the cage behind me. And then they left us alone in there, shutting the door to the holding room and bolting the lock into place. I looked at the man standing on the other side of the metal bars, the man trapped in the other cage. He smiled and laughed at me from his cot against the wall and said, <laughs> You look like shit, Riggins. Yeah, well, I'd been better, I said. Spencer Middleton stood up and walked over to the bars, leaning against them as he said, I think you should know something. This is only going to get worse. I reflectively took a step back. He'd gotten the jump on me once before, and I sure as shit wasn't going to stand close enough for him to grab me through the bars. Well, I'm not sure it can get much worse. <laughs> I've been in this cell for a week now. Trust me, it gets worse. He smiled and scratched the scar on his neck. I suppose you don't feel like taking this opportunity to tell me what the fuck is going on, do you? I'll tell you what's gonna happen. They're gonna spin a yarn about you just like they did about me. They'll sell some bullshit. The news will polish the bullshit. The people will eat the bullshit. And you, eventually, you'll start believing it too. They're all gonna lie to you. Not me. I'll never lie to you. You want to know why? Yeah, why? Because I know the truth is so much worse. <laughs> he laughed, let a long, self-satisfied laugh, and turned to go back to his cot. As he got comfortable, he added, You and me are going to have a lot of fun, Riggins. I looked at the cot on my side of the cell. It wasn't much. It wasn't long enough for me to lay on without my feet and elbows hanging off the edges. But it was better than the floor. And right now, the idea of getting some real sleep was pretty damn inviting. I woke up to the sound of a loud clang against the bars of my cell. The man standing on the other side next to the exit was the one that I had left in handcuffs outside of the hardware store the day prior. The bruise over Franklin's jaw was already a pronounced deep purple. And I have to admit, 
I was a little proud of it. I could see the thing that he used to wake me, the police baton in his right hand. No doubt, this was going to be his turn for a little petty revenge. All right, let's get this over with. Howdy, deputy, I said, standing to my feet and immediately remembering that my body was still beaten and bruised. If it had been an option, I might have just stayed in that cot until the judge threw the book at me, and they put a needle in my arm. It's time for your one phone call, Franklin said unemotionally. He led me down the hall into another small room where I was pretty sure I was about to get another round of beatings, but shockingly, the only thing in there was a small table and a corded telephone, which sat with a receiver off the hook next to it. Franklin locked the door and nodded at the table. What's going on? I approached the table, anxiously awaiting some sort of trap, but none came. Once I was certain Franklin wasn't going to crack open my skull with his baton, I reached out, grabbed the telephone receiver, and put it to my ear. Hello? I said. The voice on the other end of the line was sad and tired, but familiar. Detective, I'm sorry it's come to this. I tried every other plan I could think of, but I'm afraid we're out of choices. We go nuclear or we lose. It was Roger. Thing is, well, I'm sure you've already worked it out on your own. I'm not leaving this place alive. I'm sorry. Honestly, I'm surprised I made it this far. You remember our agreement? I'd help you the best I could, and in return, I want a favor. Well, this is it. I'm calling in my favor. And prepare yourself, because it's going to be a doozy. Franklin took out his gun, and I quickly scanned the room for a weapon to defend myself with, but then then he surprised me, and he turned the gun around and held it out. He said with a frown, Make it look good. I snatched the gun away. What is this? I asked. Roger answered. Your deputy friend here, he owed me a favor, and now, well, you know what to do. Try not to hurt him too bad. Franklin closed his eyes, and I swung the weapon hard, cracking him across the face, spurting blood all over the floor where he landed. Good, said Roger. I didn't know how the hell he could see me, but at this point, I didn't care. Now listen carefully, detective, because this is your turn. I know you know how to use that thing. There's only one way this story ends with anything remotely resembling a happy ending. You're going to go in that cell right now and put a bullet into Spencer Middleton's head. No half measures are going to work. You have to kill him. Why? I demanded. They need him. I'm sure by now you've figured out this whole thing. The invasion? Well, Spencer's the only one who knows where to find the ingredients they need to build their army. Just... Just... Just tell me one thing. Is Vanessa alive? I'm sorry, Eric. I hung up the phone. That was enough. Am I really going to do this? What else could I do? Take Franklin's gun? Shoot my way out of the sheriff's office? No. I was done for. The only thing I could do was make my death count for something. There's no person on this planet I could say was more deserving of a bullet behind the ear than Spencer fucking Middleton. Was I really going to be the one to literally pull the trigger? I took Franklin's keys, I cracked the door and looked out. There was a straight empty hallway. On one end, the way through the station full of angry men with guns on the other, the holding room. My heart pounded in my ears as I walked alone back to the room and put the key in the lock. Spencer was staring right at me when the door opened, like he had been waiting for me. Well, look at you. They turned you into their little bitch, huh? Turn around, I ordered. He refused to look away as he said, Let me tell you something. You're gonna shoot me? Better not miss. Spencer was expecting this. I chambered a round in a Franklin's gun and I prepared myself to do what I had to do. Spencer was part of this conspiracy. And his death was gonna fuck over the ones who took Vanessa. What the fuck was that? Someone was shooting in the same building as us. I turned and looked back down the hallway. Who? Well, how about that? Spencer taunted from behind me. Looks like you might need to preserve your ammo. The gunshots continued. Dozens of them now. Out there, beyond the hallways. There was a firefight. It exploded in shots and then... And then nothing. The door at the other end of the hall came crashing off the hinges along with a large chunk of the wall. 
The beast was there, holding the sledgehammer, and this time it wasn't alone. Behind it were two more creatures, just as huge and terrifying, their bodies all matched, their clothes, their height, and their wretched smell. But the heads on the other two were different. One had a somewhat human face, no hair, no ears, no nose, and no lips. Its skin, chalk white, its head swollen up to an unnaturally large size, its eyes red and bulging. The third one's head was barely more than a skull covered in red and pink oozing boils. One eye socket was vacant, and the other held a single bloodshot eye. Its mouth was just as red and skeletal with a smile. At their feet lay bodies of several deputies. I pointed the gun and fired. I kept pulling the trigger, but... Son of a bitch. Franklin only gave me one bullet. I slammed the door to the holding room and shut and scanned the area for weapons, but of course there was nothing. Without even thinking, I got inside the empty cage and closed the door behind me and locked it. Didn't take long for them to break the second door down. The creatures stepped into the room, their heads nearly touching the ceiling as they all three piled in and walked right past me to Spencer's cell. He approached them with a big smile and said, What the hell took you so long? They all grabbed the doors to Spencer's cage and pulled. The metal bent and snapped free at the hinges, and then suddenly, Spencer Middleton was free. The creature stepped back against the wall, allowing him the space to walk past. And as he left the room, he looked back at me and said, See you around. I stood in the corner, watching the monsters as they followed him out the door. They weren't here for me. And now they had what they wanted. They were done and gone. I waited there in the cell, staring at the door until I couldn't take it anymore and ran to the toilet in the corner to throw my guts up. I had failed. Failed hard. And now it was only a matter of time before somebody found this bloodbath and pinned the whole thing on me. I still have the keys. I could make a run for it. Grab Jamie, make a break for New Orleans, find a good attorney, or e even slip off the grid for a while. There's no chance for justice anymore. I'd lost the war, and now I needed to make a strategic retreat. I spit the last of the bile into the toilet and pulled the handle. Images of carnage and monsters still fresh in my mind while I tried to work out the plan. The next part was going to be rough, but I needed to get through it. Climb past the bodies. Find one with car keys. Take another car. Hey, detective. I turned around to see that psychopath waiting there, alone on the other side of the bars. What? Why did he come back? My words caught in my throat, but he didn't seem to mind guiding the conversation. Looks like you ate something that must not have agreed with you, huh? Hey. Well, before I go, I wanted to ask you something. He guided his hands between the bars. When I saw what he was holding, I felt a cold shiver run down my spine. In case you were interested, my offer is still on the table. What do you say? Do you want to know where to find her? That fucker? I'd come back with a pair of pliers. I crossed the tiny cell to where he stood, reached out and took them from him. He smiled a wicked smile, and I looked at the tool in my hands. Don't let him see you flinch. I ran my tongue across my teeth, trying to decide which one I would miss the least. I settled on one of my upper bicuspids, put the pliers to my mouth. I can still feel the sensation of the metal touching my tooth. The way it shot up my nerve into a spot below my sinuses. As I pulled and wiggled it, trying to yank it free while Spencer choked on his own laughter. And when I finally had it detached from my jaw, the blood was pouring steadily. I spat a mouthful onto the floor and placed my tooth in Spencer's outstretched palm. Then I ripped a piece of cloth from my sleeve and I bit down on it to stop the bleeding while Spencer inspected it like a diamond assessor. And once he was satisfied, he told me where I'd find Vanessa's body. I walked into the gas station looking and feeling like shit. A quick scan of the place told me that there weren't any customers in there. Behind the counter, Jack sat typing on his laptop. Toulouse leaned on the counter next to him, reading a magazine. When they saw me, I heard Jack say, Check it out. The detective's still alive. Toulouse nodded and said, Yeah, look at him go. Good for him. Before turning his attention back to the magazine, my stomach turned and I, I went straight for the bathroom where I started to drive heave into the sink. If there had been anything left in my stomach, I might have lost it there. How am I even going to do this? I looked at my reflection in the mirror and I noticed that the man dressed as a cowboy was standing in the corner behind me. 
I spun around and screamed at him. What the fuck? What the fuck even are you, man? He was thankfully wearing all of his clothes this time, including a red bandana around his neck and a cowboy hat. With a wry smile, he held out a ball-peen hammer and said in a calm voice, Make good decisions. I, I, I couldn't explain why, but that weird sentence hit me with a sense of calm and renewed focus. I took the hammer, I thanked him, and then I left the bathroom. The wall behind the notice board. That's where you'll find her. Jack and Toulouse didn't seem nearly surprised enough by what I was doing, smashing a huge hole into the wall of the gas station with a hammer. I kept swinging, breaking the hole open wider and wider, and I didn't stop until the wall was gone, exposing the dry, shriveled corpse of a young woman inside. From the looks of her, she had been dead for a long time, her skin had turned gray, her face was unrecognizable, but her clothes, still clean and new, a pair of blue jeans and a yellow t-shirt. A pair of blue jeans... and a yellow t-shirt. O'Brien was the first one on the scene. She wrote the official report, which I got a, a look at a couple weeks later. An unknown man came into the gas station, broke a hole in the wall, revealed the corpse of a young missing girl. The body was dried of all blood post-mortem, which is probably responsible for the accelerated mummification process. DNA samples and dental records proved conclusively this was the body of Vanessa Riggins. But I knew the truth. That wasn't my niece. Spencer was always very clever in the way that he worded his offer. I'll tell you where you could find the body of a certain girl. He had been referring to the double the whole time. There was a funeral, but neither Jamie nor I bothered going. I moved some money around, got the kid out of town. I won't say where he is, but believe me when I say that he's in a safe place now. As for my legal troubles, well, they actually went away on their own. One final departing gift from the ones in charge, maybe. Besides, it's too hard to arrest somebody for killing the sheriff, and the sheriff isn't dead. Yeah, I got a message not too long ago from O'Brien. Clyde showed up to work the next day, and everybody's decided to pretend he never gave himself amateur brain surgery. In fact, there's no record of anyone dying in that nice little peaceful town the whole time I was there. I had almost convinced myself that the entire thing was a stress-fueled delusion. But yesterday I got a package in the mail at my office, with no return address. The only thing inside was Donnie's old brown jacket. Then last night, I got a phone call. Hey, Uncle Eric? Yeah, this is Eric. Do you know who this is? Vanessa. Yeah, um, they told me that I could talk to you for a second. Where are you? I don't know. Some kind of hospital, I think. What is this? What's going on? I don't know. There's a man here who wants to talk to you. No, Vanessa, don't- Hey, detective. Spencer, what do you want? Me? <laughs> oh, I, I don't want anything. I just thought that I'd let you know that despite all my objections, you're taking very good care of Vanessa. Please. Okay, is that what you want to hear? You want to hear me beg? Please. Please don't hurt her. Just let her go. It's too late for that. <laughs> Even if she went home right now. No way anyone would ever believe that she was the real one. Even you. Right now, have your doubts, don't you? The line between what's real and what isn't. Start to blur so much that, <laughs> that it might not as well be one anymore. And that's what they want. They want you doubting your own eyes. They want you to wonder who's real, who's been replaced. Because that's part of the attack. You can't trust the person next to you. That's when they know they've already won. It's a brave new world, detective. And if I ever see you again, I'll skin you alive. I've tried tracking the number. But even my computer guys told me that it's a high-tech dead end. It's been months now since I started looking for my lost niece. I've used this time to prepare. The next time that I go back to that town, I'll be ready. I won't get caught off guard. And when I find her, there's gonna be hell to pay. 
Spencer isn't a complicated guy. I understood his message good and well. Sure, it sounded like a warning. But it wasn't. It was an invitation. Hi there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta. And I'm Vincent Vinacava. And today we're here to talk to you about the Creepypasta comic book. You guys have probably heard us talk about it before when it first went to Kickstarter. Well, now it's available for everybody and not just the backers. April 7th, on Amazon. Follow the link. Supplies are limited. Very limited, in fact. But you don't want to miss out on this. And it's also going to be the start of the Spooktacular this year. So you'll be able to find out what actually happened to him, whose body was stolen by Bizarro. And me, who's still stuck in the deep web. Oh, yeah! I, I don't know. I just thought it was like... I just thought I'd do that. Like it was like a catchphrase. Oh, yeah! <laughs> Snap her to a Slim Jim! <coughs> Dig it! Ah, welcome. I take it you've come for a story. Of course you did. Why else would you have tracked down my website? After all, it takes a very special browser to even locate this dark little corner of the internet. But you already knew that. So, if it's a story you want, it's a story you shall receive. And it would please me very much to read one to you this evening. All of you. Shall we begin? I've got the perfect one in mind. It's a tale about those who've been wronged, and the depths they'll sink to, in the name of revenge. The Creepypasta comic is available on Amazon, April 7th.